Mr Keith. So Christopher, I now want to turn to some of the most important COBRA meetings, and, and so that we can all understand the importance of this topic. COBRA was, of course, the crisis machinery in the heart of government that, that responded to and responds to crises, both acute and, as we'll see, longer running. And it was at those COBRA meetings that some of the most important decisions and the most important realisations came to be understood. Correct. Yes. <coughs> Um, the DHSE was obviously aware from an early stage of the novel virus, and the evidence shows that you chaired a number of meetings in January with your officials. You chaired regular meetings from January with the CMO, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Strategic Incident Director, and, and other bodies with which the DHSE was associated, Public Health England, for example, NHS England. And presumably, the DHSE, through yourself and others, attended all the COBRA meetings. Yes. So um, I chaired meetings, I think, from January the 20th, and I went on doing so until there were regular uh, ministerial uh, meetings. Um, the initial COBRA meetings were chaired by, I think is well known by the Secretary of State for Health, um, and uh, I attended, uh, I think, all the COBRA meetings that he chaired, and then the subsequent COBRA meetings where it was alternate between the Prime Minister and the uh, uh, Secretary of State. Yes. The first one that I want to take you to, although it's not the first in order, is the 29th of January 2020, page one of INQ 56226. And with all these documents and with all these minutes, Christopher, I'm going to ask you to focus, please, on what your understanding on the part of the DHSC was when you received the information and the relevant facts yep. and, and so on and so forth in the course of these meetings. We can see the attendance on the first page, the minister's second page, officials, including yourself, in the middle of the page on the left. If we go to page five, We, we can see in paragraph three the CMO telling the attendees that the UK planning assumptions were based on the reasonable worst case scenario. There were two scenarios to be considered. The first was that the spread was confined within China. The second was that the spread was not limited to China and there would be a pandemic like scenario with the UK impacted. It appears from this, Sir Christopher, that the DHSE amongst all the other attendees, was being told that if the spread, if the virus spreads from China and is not limited to China, but is anywhere else other than China, there would be a pandemic-like scenario with the UK impacted. That is to say, if it leaks from China, it's coming. Yes, that's what, uh, that's certainly what it, uh, uh, that's certainly what it says. Um, the, the CMO's views at the time, um, as he expressed them, and he, of course, is the DHSC in this case, there isn't a, sort of, there isn't a difference, um, I think were a little more nuanced uh, than uh, is uh, uh, set out uh, here. But um, uh, th th those were the two broad scenarios. In that second scenario, therefore, on the basis that the virus leaks from China, to what extent did the attendees ask themselves, well, if we're being told that if it leaks from China, there would be a pandemic-like scenario and the UK is impacted, what measures do we need to start thinking about now to stop the United Kingdom being impacted once the virus has spread from China? Um, well, so... That was the whole reason there was uh, uh, there were COBRA meetings at this time uh, at all, um, and because um, as, as I'm sure you know, it's quite a high bar. So, Christopher, uh, I'm, that, I'm so sorry. What measures were in any or all of your minds as to well, what thoughts were in your minds as to what measures could be taken 
to stop this second eventuality oh, sorry. arising. I'm totally, I'm totally sorry. I slightly misunderstood your question. Um, so um, the measures people were thinking about at the time uh, would have been all the measures up to the full implementation of the pandemic flu plan that we've uh, uh, discussed before. That's what would have been in uh, people's heads. There is no debate, if you take it from me, on the face of, of the, this document as to what those measures might be, what can be done to start putting them into place or thinking about them or arranging them. Why is that? Um, well, I mean, there was definitely thinking and discussion of that going on. Um, COBRA, and this is one of the things we need to reflect on about the uh, process, COBRA tends to deal and is set up to deal with incidents. And you see that from the agenda of this thing. It was dealing with like very specific uh, things. So from my recollection, there was definitely discussion within DHSC and within SAGE about the kinds of measures that you would need to take and discussion of the flu plan. Um, it's not in this particular meeting. That is true. So the answer is it wasn't debated in COBRA, which is the primary body for crisis in, machinery um, in the United I, Kingdom. I, 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 I haven't checked when it began to be discussed in COBRA, certainly not in this meeting. Could we look at page six, please? Paragraph 12. The reasonable worst case scenario planning. The government continuously plans for a pandemic. It's an international issue. Local resilience forums have planning assumptions for pandemic influenza. There are then a number of bullet points about repatriation, dealing with British nationals in Wuhan, pandemic plans in place for prisons, border staff PPE, transmission possibly of the virus through food or animals, and then over the page. Transport, uh, communications. Summing up 16, there must be a clear communications plan. The CMO should lead communications, more detail on Wuhan returnees. Are you surprised, looking at this now, that there was no debate at all about whether or not anything could be done to stop the virus coming once it had left China? Or secondly, what measures in practice might have to be contemplated? Um, I didn't think, I, I have to say, I didn't think so from memory about this specific meeting, uh, because I did know all those discussions about the flu plan uh, were, um, well, they were certainly going on in DHSC. Now, um, um, I mean, the closest this meeting gets to this is the, the thing we went past on the reasonable worst case scenario assumptions, and that was clearly the focus of the work at the moment, was working out uh, uh, was working out those. Now, and the only further thing I'll say is, um, at this stage, what the communications were to the general public about what they should do, um, that is the first stage um, of um, uh, preparing for a uh, uh, novel disease. I know it's not directly relevant to your question, uh, but it, it, it's more than just sorry, something very odd happened on the screen. Um, uh, it, 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 it's more than just comms in the traditional sense. So, if I'm honest, I, 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 I can't I can't say at that meeting I was surprised because the meeting was discussing, as it were, the business of the day. Communications appears to be at the forefront of matters considered by this committee. It appears to be the focus of the summing up. Why? was so much focus relatively placed on communications as opposed to considering the practical measures which might be taken to stop the virus reaching the United Kingdom, assuming it had left China? Uh, for the reason that I just said, that, w that the question, and um, um, I'm sure we want to ask our public health specialists who we were talking to later, the, um, uh, the question of what are you advising the public to do um, is the first thing uh, that you want to do, you know, whether right. you would advise people to go to particular places, wash hands, all those sorts of things. Those are public health interventions done via communications. And from my mind, and it's particularly why there's a reference to the CMO leading communications here, um, it's about, from memory, 
that sort of public health communication, no, not is the government going to issue a press notice. You've referred twice to the flu plan. Yeah. In summary, and, and is this a correct summation of the position, Sir Christopher, the flu plan upon which the government at this stage was still proceeding, yeah. dating back to 2011, the flu, yeah. plans, okay. the flu pandemic strategy, envisaged measures such as providing for proper legislative powers to be exercised, the yep. coronavirus or flu bill, the possibility of school closures, washing hands, and managing excess deaths. Were those the broad heads of the um, measures? Plus the, um, uh, uh, the communications bit. So what the flu plan envisaged... Just, just yes or no, are those the correct no. heads? You say plus... Yes, so... Um, and in some ways, the heart of the flu plan is voluntary in now. Um, must remember not to use the acronyms. Uh, Non-pharmaceutical interventions, voluntary non-pharmaceutical interventions, which are dialed up and down to control. So that is the other thing in the flu plan that we were expecting to do. So the work going on in the department at this point is: can we? update the flu plan for this different disease. But as you say, the presumption was we would be following basically the flu plan. Forgive me, which non-pharmaceutical interventions was the DHSC actively considering other than those measures which I have already mentioned, which were part of the existing flu plan? The possibility of school closures, dealing with the physical problems associated with excess deaths, arranging for legislative proposals to be advanced and washing hands. Oh, it, it's, what, uh, uh, the, it, it's what advice you give to the public um, on how they should be behaving. Those are not non-pharmaceutical interventions. What other non-pharmaceutical no, interventions? No, those are non-pharmaceutical interventions. The ones I have mentioned are non-pharmaceutical interventions. I'm asking you what else was under consideration by way of other non-pharmaceutical interventions, not communications to the public, I'm talking about practical measures to stop the spread of the virus. Oh, sorry, well, the, 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 this is where we're slightly misunderstanding. Uh, um, advice to the public on how to behave are non-pharmaceutical interventions designed to stop the spread of the virus, is my point. INQ 146557, pages one and two. This is an email enclosing minutes from a SAGE meeting. Um, it is an email which goes to the Permanent Secretary at the dhsc.gov.uk. We can see that in the top right-hand corner. Would that have been you? Uh, yes. Right. If we look down at the bottom of the page, we can see that Professor Sir Chris Whitty says, of the two, of the four scenarios, only two in practice are worth considering. The other is the opposite end of the risk scale and is our reasonable worst case scenario for which plans are also being developed. With R, the reproduction rate of two to three, that's one person infecting two to three other people in an unimmunized population, mortality of maybe 2%, wide confidence, intervals around both of these and all other numbers, a doubling time currently of maybe three to five days and an incubation period of mean five days. This could, within the next few weeks, emphasize that, please, Sir Christopher, become widespread and turn into a significant pandemic relatively quickly. The chief medical officer was saying, in essence, was he not, we have a basic understanding of, the, fatality, of, of the, in, the reproduction rate. We've got a basic understanding of the mortality rate, and therefore we can work out how many people might die. A doubling time, and therefore that this could spread within the next few weeks and become widespread. With that information available, and with the knowledge from the COBRA meeting, that once the virus has left China, if it leaves China, it's coming. 
why were those two pieces of information not put together to reach the realization with those characteristics and with no practical means of stopping it once it's left China, we are in real trouble. Um, no, and, um, and that was the view of the uh, uh, department. I mean, a few days uh, after this, uh, the chief medical officer is saying that we might be looking at uh, 100,000 to 300,000 deaths in that uh, uh, scenario. Um, and um, uh, that was uh, the basis that, that that might happen at this place, not that it will, but it might, uh, was the basis on which DHSC was working. Once it leaves China, it will happen. Yeah, and the once is very uh, 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 is very important here. So, so Chris and I've talked to him on a number of occasions uh, about this. Uh, it was clear that the conditional bit of that is very important. So and he's not saying there will be a pandemic. He's saying. Um, if it's not controlled in China, then it's very likely to become a pandemic. And then, as becomes clear uh, a few days later, um, he is saying, and in the UK, that might lead to 100 to 300,000 deaths. So there was no, I don't, I don't think there's any sort of dispute about what we thought at that time. And by the beginning of February, you discovered that it had indeed left China. At, uh, well, in, in, um, uh, at that point, uh, in extremely small uh, numbers. Now, this is why I say that the CMO's view is rather slightly more nuanced, or certainly how he described it to me, uh, than, um, uh, 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 than uh, uh, is uh, set out here. So, I mean, I'll say you'll, I'm sure you will ask him yourself, but his view is, if you have, as it were, very small outbreaks out that can be contained in exactly the same way as our strategy started with contain, uh, then of course it doesn't become a pandemic. It's when you get sustainable human to human transmission across a wide range of countries. At that point, his view was it was very, very difficult to stop and would become a pandemic. So you're saying that the assertion in the Cobra Minute that the virus would become widespread, the second contingency, it would become widespread once it le leaked from China. I think it's is wrong. No, it's not wrong. Um, it's a, uh, um, certainly as I understood the CMO's views, but of course you ask him yourself that it's a, um, um, it's about what you mean by leaked from. So a case, one case appearing in another country that is, identified, contained, and doesn't lead to human transmission, he would not say that is it has leaked from China. Once you've got sustained human-to-human -human transmission outside uh, uh, China, I think that's what he would describe as a leak. I mean, um, I'm slightly... Um, why, why, why am I... Oh, I don't, I don't I'm, like I'm asking, talking for the chief medical. That was my understanding. That's right. I'm asking for your understanding. Yeah. INQ146558. Is a letter from the Downing, uh, private secretary in Downing Street to um, the DHSC because it says the Prime Minister met your Secretary of State, the CST, and colleagues from the Centre today for his first DHSC departmental performance meeting. Much of this statement or this letter deals with matters concerning the NHS objectives for manifesto commitments, performance, and so on. There was, however, in the meeting, a short update on coronavirus, which appears to relate to the need to explain the plan, whatever that plan was, and dealing with travel restrictions. Why was so little time, relatively speaking, devoted in that meeting to coronavirus in light of the information from the COBRA and that email from the chief medical officer saying the plausible scenario is once the virus leaks from China, it is coming. So um, at, uh, I've covered uh, this uh, meeting in quite some detail in my statements. But so um, the meeting was set up at the request of the prime minister to cover. Sir Christopher, I don't wish to be impolite. Please, would you answer the question? Why was so little time, relatively speaking, spent on the issue of coronavirus during this meeting? Um, well, 
what, what time was devoted to what um, was the choice of the chair of the meeting, which was the Prime Minister. All right. So, so your answer had, is the Prime Minister... We had, we, we, we had asked for coronavirus to be added to the agenda, uh, and the CMO came specially, was not an original invite to the meeting, because we believed that we should update on uh, the status of COVID, which was done. Um, how the meeting was then run in practice was, as I say, a matter for the chair. I came out of the meeting thinking that um, the messages about how serious this was and what the likely death toll would be had been delivered. So I wasn't thinking that um, uh, our, our objectives for that bit of the meeting had not been achieved, even though it covers lots of other things. In my head, we were there to tell the Prime Minister this is very serious and the likely death toll and to have been here from the CMO, and that had all been achieved. Do you agree that the letter from Downing Street reflecting upon the meeting on behalf of the Prime Minister, makes absolutely no reference to the death rates. No, it doesn't. And um, um, which um, uh, now my uh, well, just just yes or no, please. Uh, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I mean, just as a matter of fact, it does not. The Cobra meeting on the fifth of February, five six two one five, page one, attendees, page two. Officials, you're there again. Page five, paragraph two. The CMO said, on average, individuals who died as a result of the novel coronavirus have spent between seven to days and 10 days in hospital. The two most high risk groups appear to be the elderly and those with pre existing illnesses. The fatality rate estimate remained at two to three percent. Scrolling back out, please. Paragraph four deals with the issue of returnees. Paragraph six notes that screening controls would be unlikely to delay the arrival of the virus by very much. Paragraph seven deals with communications. I'm sorry, it deals with repatriation of those persons coming back from China. I think maybe item three deals with, uh, item four deals with communication strategy and item three, reasonable worst case scenario. The director of the civil contingency secretary set out the planning priorities. The following points were made. The need for a clear communication strategy, an emergency bill to support the UK's response and the link between the devolved administrations and local resilience forums. Where was the debate about whether or not borders or a test and trace system or other practical form of NPI could prevent the spread of the virus if it came to the United Kingdom? Um, well, I think, um, and this is from memory, if we look at the slides uh, mentioned in paragraph 9, um, that is the report of the planning that is being done for the, um, uh, 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 for the reasonable worst-case scenario, which is that the virus has escaped from China and become a pandemic. So I think it is that bit of the discussion. The planning priorities there referred to were drawn, were they not, from the 2011 pandemic flu strategy document, which, as we've discussed, talked in terms of washing hands, talked in terms of the possibility of closing schools, talked in terms of how to manage large numbers of dead people and communications. And, and the things I mentioned uh, earlier. Now, on the two things you raise uh, specifically, so the closing of borders, um, and I can't remember uh, the, um, uh, the exact date, but our, uh, our, our scientific and clinical advice at the time, and certainly the WHO, uh, WHO's advice, uh, was that uh, closing borders uh, would have not more than a marginal timing uh, effect. So I'm not surprised... We've that, read that, uh, yeah. that bit out. Yes, uh, so I'm not surprised that was uh, uh, not uh, uh, discussed. And at this point, um, I don't think anyone in the UK uh, was talking about an extensive test and trace 
system as being a possibility. Again, given the, at this point, I don't think we, I may get my timeline wrong, but this is just the, uh, the, the, this is the point when the first tests are being invented, as it were. Certainly no one was talking about an extensive test and trace system at this time, so I'm not surprised it wasn't discussed. Uh, so is this the position? Borders, border measures by way of screening for symptoms and the like, what was, and you, in fact, your department advised on the 21st of February, and the measures and the advice were accepted on the 22nd, uh, sorry, of January. The advice was accepted by the Secretary of State on the 22nd of January, to the effect that symptom screening at borders was unlikely to be particularly effective. Yes. And would only secure a few days delay, if that. Yeah. There was a recognition that there was no testing system scaled up or in place. Well, Other I mean, than the first few hundred index cases, there was no real test trace system, was there? No. And that was because under the 2011 pan flu strategy, it was understood you don't need and you don't have to have a test trace system for dealing with flu, correct? Um, uh, well, ba ba basically, basically, yes. Right. Um, as I say, the, at, at that point, there's no testing infrastructure at all. So, yes. the yeah. doctrinally, because of the latent period, the incubation period, the characteristics of flu, there's no point having a test trace system. You take Tamiflu and antiviral, and you wait it out. For this virus, which you knew was not a flu virus, where was the understanding that you did need a test, a massively scaled up test trace system, if there was to be any practical means of preventing the virus from reaching the United Kingdom and spreading? Um, that came much later. Why didn't it come then? Um, well, because at this point, um, I'll say I can't quite remember uh, the timeline of the actual creation of, um, uh, uh, creation of tests. Uh, but it's um, uh, it, it's a diagnostic. Time. If you yeah. forgive me, now. the United Kingdom on the yeah. same day as South Korea invented a diagnostic test for coronavirus. Yeah. It was in, in fact, the middle of January. But there was no scaling up of the test and scale, the test and trace system beyond the first few hundred index cases until well after. Yes, no, that's that, um, that, 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 that's correct. And at this point, um, the, um, uh, the scientific advice we were uh, receiving um, was, I'm not quite sure what the right words are, not, 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 not definitive about how good even the tests were at this point. So for quite a long period, uh, for example, it was believed that the test did not reliably pick up either pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic uh, uh, cases, and it wasn't clear how reliable it was uh, for symptomatic uh, cases till a bit later. So at this point, um, with the development of testing, the, the testing technology and the understanding of the testing, nobody, um, as far as I know, was uh, uh, from either uh, the policy side or the clinical or scientific side was saying that what you're laying out was a practical proposition um, for stopping the virus getting into the country in the first place. So the focus was, as is then set out in the plan on um, March the 3rd, on the contain, uh, 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 the contain bit and then the other stages uh, of the plan. Do you accept that other countries turned it very much into a practical proposition? Oh well, and um, and I've said uh, uh, I've said before that uh, um, uh, some countries in um, uh, uh, Southeast Asia clearly did very very well. Yes. Uh, to, now the only thing I'd add on this, and I, again I think I put it in my statement, uh, um, um, even the countries in Europe, um, which had a much bigger uh, testing uh, capacity, particularly Germany, which had a very extensive diagnostics. Uh, industry, uh, they didn't succeed in using testing to stop uh, the uh, virus uh, getting in uh, either. So it wasn't simply a question of um, how many tests uh, you have. And as the chief medical officer uh, 
gave in his witness statement uh, in uh, his um, uh, evidence to Module 1, when you look at what South Korea had done, what they'd done was a very big investment in public health in general, of which testing was one part, as it were. So what, what I wouldn't like to leave you the impression with was that even, even looking at Southeast Asia, that the testing bit is a complete silver bullet. It was clearly they did it very well. They did it much better than us. I think there is absolutely no doubt about that. Um, but at this point, no one in the UK was thinking of a test and trace system as being uh, the answer. Regardless of Germany, with which we're not overly concerned in this inquiry, regardless of whether it was a silver bullet, there was no practical or policy consideration given at all until very much later to the practical proposition of a test and trace system to prevent the spread of the virus. No, and the advice we were uh, receiving uh, from our clinicians and scientists didn't include uh, that uh, measure. That is true. 56227 is a COBRA on the 18th of February. At this stage, we can see there the attendees, page two, the officials, including yourself again, page five, a CMO update, a debate about the reasonable worst case scenario. And I, I'm not going to deal with you with the point about whether or not focusing on the reasonable worst case scenario and whether it would eventuate misdirected attention away from the reality of what was happening. But this COBRA minute makes plain that you'll, you'll see from the CMO's description on paragraph two, there was a risk of onward transmission, escalation to a global pandemic remain realistic possibilities. Scrolling back out, please. Repatriation, paragraph four. Paragraph five, the repatriation of nationals and the possibility of infection from persons entering the United Kingdom. Scrolling back out. And then going to the next page. Legislation. So again, a debate about the legislative basis for anything that might need to be done. Scrolling back out again, the following page. Planning for a reasonable worst case scenario, the Director of Civil Contingency Secretariat said that there was work to be done to create a clear plan of activity across the United Kingdom government from the moment of sustained transmission to its estimated peak. If you're right, Sir Christopher, that there was already thinking about NPIs and what measures reflective of the existing <coughs> flu strategy or additional to the existing flu strategy could be contemplated and imposed. Why was the COBRA still at the stage of just talking about the need to create a clear plan of activity? Um, well, I mean, what it says is there's still work to be done, which there definitely was. Uh, the work had begun, but I, it had not finished. But um, um, I, think it, uh, I think the situation is exactly as um, uh, described on the page. You were obviously closely engaged with Number 10 and Dan, Downing Street and, uh, and the Cabinet Office through these late days in February, were you not? Yes. Um, how effective was the working relationship at ministerial and at official level? Um, so, and, uh, and again, I've done this in some detail in my uh, uh, witness statement. Um, I believed that um, in terms of relations uh, at official level, uh, that, um, uh, actually, throughout the pandemic, they were good uh, with the uh, uh, Cabinet Office. And um, at political level, and um, we've discussed some of this already, they were rather more uh, up and down. Uh, but we felt we had good communications, that we got a hearing, that we'd uh, engaged with the Civil Contingencies Secretariat, that COBRAs were happening, all those things we had asked for. Um, we felt those um, relationships were good. You say in your statement that conflicts and tensions were time-consuming and consequently affected the efficiency of the government's response. So it appears you accept that to some degree, but we mustn't over-exaggerate it, 
the ability of the government to respond were, was adversely affected. Yeah, by I mean, um, so um, and, and uh, it won't surprise you. I thought about my words here extremely carefully. So, um, and it's exactly as I say in my witness statement. So. I don't believe, and I've never believed, that the core decision-making of which NPI to implement when in this period, this March period, uh, was affected by any of those uh, issues. When I, it was my recollection at the time, and when I've reviewed the evidence, you can see the golden thread from the scientific advice we were receiving to the decisions that the government made on NPI. So I thought that core bit was following a proper process of advice, etc. What was affected uh, by the issues that you uh, mention uh, was exactly as you said, it was the efficiency of the government machine uh, to do a number of other things. Right. We had two, and I think I raised, uh, and it's in the evidence, uh, two very specific practical things um, that went wrong that made us less efficient. One was um, uh, meetings being called by several different bits of Downing Street and Cabinet Office at the same time with the same people on the same subject. And the other, uh, which I have some text exchanges with Tom Shino and with uh, uh, Mark Sedwell on, is multiple commissions on the same uh, issue. Um, and in one case, I think there were two or three commissions on a procurement issue, which turned out none of them were what the Prime Minister wanted, and we wasted an entire day. So there were definitely, I'm not disputing at all, there were definitely those sorts of issues. I didn't think, and I didn't raise, um, therefore, that those core decisions on MPIs, I didn't see any of that being affected by those uh, uh, issues. But the efficiency of the government's response was affected. Um, yes, I, yes and, well, or no. And um, at, uh, uh, in, the, in the examples I have given, and I put it on record at the time, and we dealt with them, yes. Right. INQ 279915 is a record of a WhatsApp communication between yourself and then Sir Mark Sedwell, yeah. where on the 18th of March, you were worried about the fact that number 10 spads were attending SAGE. Yes. By the 18th of March, deaths w had started to occur in the United Kingdom, had they not? Yeah, and by the no, 18th... No, just please wait for the question. Oh, sorry. Yes. Why were you concerned with a matter of process of this type as to who was attending SAGE when presumably the focus of every single minister and official should have been on the delivery the outcome of these committee meetings and what was being done? Um, because of the, uh, uh, the part at the um, um, uh, top of the page. So 18th of March is between um, the decision on the 16th of March to go for much more extensive voluntary uh, restrictions and then the decision on the 23rd uh, of uh, March to go for full lockdown. My concern about SAGE here, and I say I was normally a big fan of SAGE. My specific uh, concern was in the, is in the second text here, which is, as far as I could see, SAGE had changed its um, analysis, uh, particularly around, um, I think it was um, the effects on the NHS, without there being an explanation of new data. So that was what I was concerned about. Right. And then I was concerned about the purity of the sage advice which was going to the Prime Minister and others because SPADs were uh, available. Those were my concerns, so I raised them. So, Christopher, a concern about the substance of the advice coming from SAGE is one thing. Why were you wasting time concerned with the process of the system? Um, because um, whether the advice is pure, and this was the reference to Chilcot, you will see here, um, that one of the uh, key findings uh, of um, the various reports around the Iraq war, including the Chilcot one, was the mixing up of the technical factual advice um, and the uh, uh, political uh, advice. That is the reference to Chilcot. Now, as I say, this had been a key issue in that right. inquiry, I, I'm, I'm going we to therefore wanted to take it very seriously. Forgive me. You've made the point you were concerned about 
the, the recommendations of the Chilcot Inquiry. We don't need to go into what they were. Let's go back a few days to another COBRA, the 26th of February, 56216. Pages 1 to 3 give us the attendees. If you just scroll, please, through page 2, we can see that, again, you're there. And then if we look at uh, page 5, paragraph 1, an update on the current global situation. There was particular concern at the 26th of February, Cobra, wasn't there, Sir Christopher, about the fact that in Italy there had been an explosion of the virus. There had, of course, been a, a, a quarantining or a lockdown of a number of northern mun municipalities in Italy, and concern was expressed there about sustained human-to-human -human transmission in Italy, which receives a high number of travellers to and from the United Kingdom. If we scroll back out again and just cast our eyes down the page, we have health advice for travellers and schools. Over the page, international response, that's to say helping other countries and helping the WHO, and then D on page uh, 6, paragraph 11, the reasonable worst-case planning assumptions look close to becoming the reasonable planning assumptions as cases in Italy demonstrated the need for heightened alertness. Progress legislation ensure good public communications. And there are references then to massive numbers of deaths under the reasonable worst-case scenario, which was, of course, appearing increasingly to be the reality. Guidance on excess death management, a reference to economic impact. And then if we just go over and scroll pages 8, 9, and 10, we'll see references to travellers. Thank you. Excess death management and, and actions for the processing of the bill, the COVID-19 bill. Where is the practical debate about measures to stop or control the spread of the virus, which is now in Italy and is envisaged to undoubtedly, if it had not already come to the United Kingdom, to come here? Um, so um, I would uh, say that would be in the HMG preparedness section that you described. Now, of course, the other thing that was going on at the moment, which I think every attendee at the meeting would have known is this is when we were preparing the for publication the uh, uh, the COVID action plan that went out on third uh, of March, um, and that was the big thing uh, that was being done uh, at that point, which was to set out that uh, strategy, and the um, uh, and just for completeness, we were of course still in the contain phase uh, in the UK yes. at this time. On the 28th of February, before that action plan was published. A paper was prepared by the Civil Contingency Secretariat with the assistance of the Department of Health, correct? Uh, yes, I don't remember the paper at the time, but having read it, that is clearly uh, the case. 146569. The UK's preparedness, written by the Civil Contingency Secretariat. Paragraph 1, COVID-19 looks increasingly likely to become a global pandemic, although this is not yet certain. Yep. Did you agree with that sentence? Um, at that point, I thought, um, I mean, as I say, I don't remember the paper at the time, but as I say, WHO at this point had not declared a global uh, pandemic. <coughs> we were still in the contain uh, fray, D phase. I'm but so sorry to interrupt, Sir Christopher. Regardless of whether the United Kingdom was in a contain or delay or mitigate stage, a matter of process in a plan yet to be published, did you think on the 28th of February that that sentence was correct? Um, well, sorry, I didn't see that sentence on the 28th of uh, uh, February. Were you? I, 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 I think, um, and the danger of hindsight is very large, I think um, that uh, our and the CMO's views was that it was very, very likely indeed at this point. So that crucial document setting out for the first time in this form the Civil Contingency Secretariat's view, the crisis machinery's view in government of the UK's preparedness, starts with a sentence 
of vital importance that is materially mistaken, in your view? Um, not materially uh, mistaken. The sentence is not inconsistent with what I have right. said. I think, uh, and as I say, the danger of hindsight here is very high. I, I, I think at that point, um, uh, I and the CMO would have, uh, and particularly the CMO, um, would have made it stronger than that. But as I say, my danger of hindsight, just to be completely honest, my danger of hindsight is very... Well, well where is the hindsight, Christopher? You said, I think that the CMO's view was that it was very, very likely indeed at this uh, point. Yeah. No, where I is mean, the hindsight in that? No, so, well, um, at, uh, I, it, it, it's very easy to say on a particular date a view was X, which I can't evidence. Um, but uh, but I, I, So I'm giving you what I think is my honest view. The UK's approach underpinned by science, we'll come back to the issue of following the science in a moment, is currently to contain the small number of cases here and reassure the public. When you, your department, your officers, your officials read this document, what answer did they come up with to the question, how is the United Kingdom to currently contain the small number of cases here? Um, well, so, at this point, when you've got a small number of cases, uh, you can uh, contain uh, via um, contact tracing, and that was what was being hap happening at this uh, uh, at this time. Um, you go into the delay phase, as it came, as you say, in the strategy later, at the point when you can no longer uh, do that. So. Um, that sentence, I assume, is a reference to that. The action plan, could we have, please, 106, 107? This was, the inquiry has heard, an action plan which was described by a number of, or one particular official in Downing Street as being a comms plan. Mr Warner said in a statement, where was the real plan? This plan had its genesis, although it was dated the 3rd of March, sometime before, in a request from the Secretary of State in early February, correct? Um, I can't remember the exact date. 106, that, 107. That, that he commissioned, but... Um... Tenth of February from somebody in the Exchange Administrative Group. We've discussed updating the 2011 pandemic flu strategy. So just noting there, Sir Christopher, the prevailing impact of that 2011 strategy on documents being brought together, drawn up in the face of the coronavirus pandemic. I want to flag that the Secretary has commissioned for this week a coronavirus version of the strategy document. There are many pan-flu supporting strategies which are more recent, but this is an additional ask, and so on. Yeah. So on the 10th of February, an action plan designed to deal with the fast-moving, new, novel, viral pandemic was sought to be introduced, to be drawn up. Yeah. If you look, please, at the minutes of the meeting in which that direction was made, 279883, you will see we're building a campaign site which will be the public window for the plan. We'd like to get the site launched next week. And then for, over the page, please, page two. The Secretary of State wants an acronym for the plan. There was a debate about how you describe the mitigate phase. On timings, he'd be happy to publish on the 24th of February, however later that week or up to the 2nd of March would also be fine. You were aware that the position was changing rapidly, yep. hour by hour, day by day. What was the point on the 10th of February of commissioning a report that wouldn't be published until up to the 2nd of March, by which time, no doubt, events had moved on radically. Um, well, and from memory, this is why it was, um, 
extremely difficult to finalise the plan because you were updating it uh, uh, for uh, uh, events as you uh, uh, went. So I was confident, and indeed we had the uh, Chief Medical Officer sign off the factual accuracy of the plan, that the plan as published was up to date at that point. Um, obviously something that if it had been written on the 10th of March and then published on the uh, uh, sorry, the 10th of February and published on the 2nd of March, it wouldn't have been. When the report, the action plan, was published on the 3rd of March, it proposed that the United Kingdom there and after adopt a strategy comprising, firstly, control and, secondly, delay. C contain. That's a contain, yeah. I apologise, contain and then delay. Spy MO had by that date formally acknowledged sustained community transmission in the United Kingdom, had it not? Yeah, there was a scientific uh, debate going on uh, at this point. I mean, the actual decision on where you, when you move from contain to delay was uh, taken by, I think, the chief medical officer. Uh, and I um, uh, don't have it here, but there were a series of scientific uh, uh, debates about whether we were still in the contain phase, moving into the delay phase, uh, and that decision was finally taken on, I believe, the 12th of uh, March. So, at the date of publication, a formal part of the government scientific advisory process, SPY-MO, had already formally acknowledged that there was sustained community transmission within the United Kingdom, yes. i.e., Yes, that but that was not. Yes, but that was not the whole of the scientific advice we received. As I say, there was a scientific debate going on uh, at this point, which was resolved, as I say, by the scientists. This was your department's action plan, or at least an action plan to which you contributed. Yeah. Did you not ask yourself on the third of March, why are we publishing a plan that provides for containment and delay in the future, when I am aware? that SPIMO has, as a committee, formally acknowledged the existence of sustained community transmission, that is to say, um, absence of control in the United Kingdom. Yeah, because the formal scientific advice, uh, which is consensus uh, uh, advice, um, uh, drawing on a range of scientific uh, sources, was given to us uh, by, in this case, the CMO, but normally the CMO and the uh, Government Chief Scientific Advisor on advice of, phase, uh, uh, of SAGE, and they were at that point not advising that we were out of the uh, uh, contain uh, phase. That happened, as I say, I think on the uh, 12th of March, the day after uh, WHO had declared a pandemic. But the United Kingdom's position did not, of course, depend on whether or not the WHO had declared a pandemic or not. Uh, no, no, but um, it depended upon what the, uh, in this case, CMO's assessment was of the consensus of scientific uh, uh, opinion, which, and I'm sure you were asking this question, you know, that is a judgment call, and scientists had different, uh, uh, had different views, um, and uh, that is how our uh, scientific advice worked. Strategy. We are not going to re-debate, Sir Christopher, the, the, the proper meaning to be given to a one-peak strategy or mitigation versus suppression. You, you know very well what the, what the debate is. You say in your statement that you believe, with hindsight, that you did place too much store in shielding as being the key measure in reducing deaths from COVID? Uh, personally, is. yes. Um, now, and I, th I, I, just, I hope I may... W will you please just wait for the question? You say in your statement you believe you place too much store in shielding. Shielding is, of course, a crucial part of the mitigation, the squashings from Brero, with added herd immunity strategy, because you allow the virus has spread through parts of the population while shielding the vulnerable, and you hope, you expect, a majority or some or a proportion will become infected, and that will then prevent reinfection, or rather prevent novel infection later, and a, and a second wave. Uh, not quite, no. Well, so, as I've described in my statement, I didn't 
think of um, herd immunity and uh, as an objective. I, I, I'm not saying it's objective. I said it was a byproduct of the one-wave yeah. mitigation strategy. Yeah. No, no, can, no, can no, I, no, no, no. I'm so sorry, Sir Christopher. You just have to wait for the question. To what extent did you and the DHSC resist the change of strategy that took place from mitigation to suppression between the 9th of March and that weekend of the 14th, 15th of March? Um, that's not when the change uh, occurred. So I'll say a couple of things. So I've been very surprised by the number of references to a, a, a one-peak uh, strategy. I don't remember that being said uh, at the time at all. Um, and I know it's come up in a number of witness statements, and um, uh, as I've read and listened, that has surprised me. Um, almost all pandemics uh, in the whole of human history have had more than one uh, wave. Well, it's very Please annoying. let us not worry but, about why no, as doctrinally... You, as, the, as, as um, you, forgive right. me, Sir Christopher, yeah. why doctrinally it came to be called by some people as right, okay. the one-wave yeah. strategy. So, it is what it is. Yeah. Now, why, if you so, did... And you made it, you maybe you did not, but did you resist the change in strategy that other parts of the government came to understand was required and then began to pursue? Um, I don't think I did uh, resist. The change happens, and I set this out in my witness statement, of my recollection, recollection, between the 16th of March and the 23rd of March. And as I understood it, you know, basically up until the 16th of March, uh, we are still uh, following basically the flu plan um, of voluntary, um, at that point, quite heavy restrictions. Um, and then between the 16th and the 23rd, uh, the government switches to legal uh, 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 restrictions, which become known as uh, lockdown. I've set out in my statement why I think uh, that uh, uh, change uh, occurred. Um, I don't think I particularly... Uh, but I don't think I did resist uh, that uh, uh, strategy, and I don't think DHSC did. I think there was a general move uh, in government that um, the position we established on the 16th, in line with the scientific advice at the time of heavy voluntary restrictions, wasn't going to be enough, and we switched to um, legal restrictions on the 23rd. Do you agree that from the 1st of March onwards, there were scientists in Imperial College London, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, beginning to realize and beginning to say openly, with this infection fatality rate, with this infection hospitalization rate, with this number of people in the population, there is going to be a massive wave of deaths. Um, yes, there were definitely scientists saying that. And the debate, and this is very important, uh, was about the timings of uh, restrictions, uh, not that would, there would need to be so. So, And the clearest uh, description of this is at the COBRA on the, uh, uh, on the 12th of March, uh, where SAGE sets out, and Patrick Valence describes this very clearly, um, the MPIs that were being considered and SAGE's recommendation on which ones should be done now and which ones uh, should wait a few weeks. So on the 12th of March, uh, the government accepts exactly what SAGE, via the government chief scientist, uh, has advised on which NPIs are needed at that precise moment in time. When, when Sir Christopher, did you realise as was an inevitable part of any reasonable worst-case scenario involving 800,000 deaths, that it was that reasonable worst-case scenario that was coming to pass, and it would inevitably involve the swamping of the NHS? Um, I, can't, um, I can't put a specific date on it. I agreed, and I think I've said this in my witness statement, I agreed with the uh, SAGE advice uh, that we received on that day. Um, it made sense to me, given the data. And as I say, and you'll see this very, very clearly in the minutes, that the debates were not about 
would we have to take further uh, restrictions. The debate was about what is the best time to implement those uh, restrictions, and, I, and uh, that was a debate, I, as I say, I agreed with. The debate about what measures could work and when they should best be employed was a different debate from the stark realisation that unless something radical was done, the NHS would be overwhelmed. And as I say, the question that was being debated was what, when is the right point in the upturn um, to implement which NPI? And that is what we received uh, SAGE uh, advice on, which was in part based uh, on their assessment of uh, what the effect on the NHS would be. And <coughs> that changes radically between 12th uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the 16th, uh, when we get um, updated advice that basically says we're much further up the curve than we thought we were. On the uh, 12th of March, forgive me, on the 12th of March, you had a WhatsApp exchange with Lord Sedwell. Could we have 279901? Where, notwithstanding the emerging scientific view that there would be a, a wall of death that would swamp the NHS, notwithstanding the figures from the NHS beginning to emerge as to bed capacity, and therefore the need for a radical change in strategy to suppression. Lord Sedwell said to you, I don't think the Prime Minister and co have internalised yet the distinction between minimising mortality and not trying to stop most people getting it. So, a reference to the herd immunity debate. Do you agree? Um, well, and um, is that a reference to the herd immunity debate? No, I don't. No, I don't think it is. So, what Mark says here um, is pretty much identical uh, to what Patrick Vallance says at the COPA meeting later that day that we've just been uh, discussing. So, um, as far as I'm concerned, Mark was reflecting the state of the scientific advice at that point. Which well, was indeed, saying. presumably, like chickenpox, we want people to get it and develop herd immunity before the next wave. So, obviously, it was a reference to the herd immunity debate, Sir Christopher. Oh, yeah, he was, uh, he, he, he was talking about the uh, uh, herd immunity. Um, and now, your position was exactly right yeah, I mean, I was very loose. We make the point every meeting. They don't quite get it. Well, Why I, I, were you, Sir Christopher, still wedded to the mitigation herd immunity approach in the face of the emerging scientific evidence, the advisory evidence commissioned well, by your own department? I would, I would refer you to the very clear... Uh, scientific advice from the body that was charged with drawing up the consensus, which was SAGE, via the government's chief scientist given to COBRA on this very day, um, uh, endorsing that strategy. Now, I was very, very loose uh, in my reply. I, I, I was answering the exact question at the end of Mark's um, uh, 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 text uh, that we should be focusing on uh, protecting the most vulnerable. Uh, to, um, but as I say, what Mark sets out there is pretty much exactly, as I say, what we were hearing from SAGE and what the uh, government chief scientist presented at the COBRA meeting on that day. So it wasn't an unusual uh, uh, position here. And I accepted, as I've said, I agreed with the SAGE advice. On the 15th of March at 5pm, that weekend, yeah. when there were multiple meetings of the Prime Minister... Mr. Cummings and Mr. Warner and Ms. McNamara and others had raised their concerns about the calamity, the catastrophe that was about to overwhelm the United Kingdom. The Prime Minister has had, as I said, a number of meetings in which he asked his advisers as to what should be done. And there was repeated debate about the need to change strategy and whether herd immunity approach or mitigation approach was leading the United Kingdom astray. At that 5 p.m. meeting, there was debate, was there not, about the need to accelerate and suppress, accelerate measures and suppress the virus. And you were there. Yep. Mr. Cummings was there. Sir Patrick Vallance was there. Mr. Warner was there. 
correct? Yes. In Sir Patrick Vallance's notes and in Mr Cummings's, Mr. Cummings's witness statement, there is a reference to you when Sir Patrick Vallance said, we must change course, we must accelerate practical measures, we must suppress this virus, it's going to overwhelm us, that you were incandescent. I got a ticking off indirectly from the permanent secretary of the DHSC. Yeah, um, and I have to say, well, and as I've said before, I have huge respect uh, for Patrick, and he was clearly referring to something. I do not have any recollection um, of uh, uh, ticking off uh, the government chief scientist. I clearly said something that caused him uh, to think that, and as I say, uh, at, uh, um, uh, Sir Patrick is one of the most honest and straightforward people I know, so I'm not uh, denying his that. But I, I, I don't recall... Uh, uh, doing anything as described there. It may have been a miscommunication. Um, and I think it says, uh, I haven't got the thing on screen, but I think it does say indirectly. So it may have been a miscommunication. And in who, terms who, of that... Who, who, says, who says that? Uh, sorry, I, I, I don't have it on the screen. I thought you said indirectly. I Saturday, mid-March, I dropped a bombshell of needing to move fast. I got a ticking off indirectly from the permanent secretary of the DHSC. He yes. was incandescent. Um, got a ticking off indirectly. Yeah, so um, it may be, as I say, I don't remember this intent uh, at all. It may be when he says I got a ticking off indirectly, somebody said to him that. I don't know who that person was and I don't know what they're referring to. Now, in terms of the meeting itself... No, no, just, just pause there, please. Yep. I haven't asked you about the meeting generally. No. It became apparent and more and more people signed up to the change of strategy that there had to be more stringent measures yep. imposed. And there were measures imposed on the 16th of March. Yep. And then, of course, firstly, consideration had to be given, time had to be allowed to see whether those measures work. Correct? Secondly, yes. the government had to be able to have time to put into place the practical arrangements associated with any further stringent measures, correct? Yep. And so no decision was taken to lockdown over that weekend of the 14th, 15th March, was it? Uh, no, and um, my recollection of the uh, meeting um, was that by the end of the meeting, where there'd been a... Uh, as you say, a robust debate about what the right thing to do was. Uh, my recollection was everyone had coalesced around the actually rather extensive package that then went to COBRA the next day. And the package announced. put into place on the 16th? Yes. Right. And, and as far as I was concerned, the meeting and all the participants in it had, by the end of the meeting, agreed that that package was the right set of things to do. And the DHSC was tasked with the obligation of providing a battle plan, yep. an overarching plan for how these measures would work, what needed to be done, and, of course, envisaging any further possibility of yeah. further more stringent now, um, at, um, now the... I, I just If you would just agree that no, your no. department took on the obligation of developing and producing a battle plan. Yeah, so we were formally commissioned on, I believe, the 20th of March. 20th of March. The, um, the actual work that went in to the battle plan had begun uh, considerably before that, I think basically from the point of the strategy. So we were able to deliver the battle plan back on, I think, the 22nd. Now, we didn't develop it from scratch over those two days, as you will imagine. So it was the culmination um, of a, uh, a, a large set of work within the, uh, uh, within the department. All right. Now, the lockdown decision and the time... Are you moving? Yeah. Yes, Melody, I am. <coughs> I think probably... Um, we'll take a ten-minute break now because I suspect we're going to have to take another break because it could be I'm a long I'm sorry, day yes, I'm afraid so. So I shall return at five past three. Sorry for another interruption. Bye. So, Christopher, the lockdown, the mandatory stay-at-home order of the 23rd of March, 
ultimately, the national lockdown, if I may call it that, was ordered when it became apparent that the NHS would be overwhelmed and the existing measures of the 16th of March proved not to be enough to ensure compliance. In your statement, you recognise that the voluntary NPIs, if we may call them that, of the 16th of March proved not to be enough, which is why a lockdown had to be, in the end, imposed. Uh, not, not quite. Well, will you just wait, wait, wait for my question, please? You do accept that had voluntary NPIs, as you described them, been introduced earlier, it is possible and I emphasise only possible that they might have worked and there may have been no need for a lockdown in order to preserve the NHS. Oh, sorry. Right. Um, so, um, we, we don't know and we will never know um, what the effect of the 16th March package would have been um, because there was not long enough between it and the national lockdown uh, to be able to tell, uh, which is why I phrased my statement in the way that I uh, did. I think, and and there is, from what I have seen, there is some evidence that the wave was already beginning to turn because of the 16th of March package. But I say we will never know because we introduced the 23rd March. The um, and I set out in my witness statement the reasons why I think the government uh, changed uh, course, which was certainly a belief uh, amongst a number of people that those measures were not enough. Um, it was seeing lockdowns all over Europe and us being out of um, step. And it was a sense driven by a lot of the media reporting that people were not complying with the 16th of March. Things. And Should. So, so in my mind, it was those three reasons yes. but just to be clear I'm not I, I I don't know and we can't know what the effect of that 16th March package would actually have been but you accept it is at least possible that had those 16th of March measures been thought of conceived and imposed earlier and I emphasize yeah possibility then there may have been no need for a lockdown. Um, we that, just don't know. That, that is certainly a possibility. Right. And as I've said in my statement, um, with hindsight, we were at least a week late um, at all points of the MPI decisions. I agreed with the decisions at the time and the timing. But looking back, um, uh, we should have done each of the things on the 12th, 16th, 23rd, if we had got to the 23rd at least a week earlier. Should the government have changed course earlier? If it had, then, of course, whatever measures were imposed on the 16th of March might have been imposed earlier. Yep. And there may have been an earlier realisation that there were no other practical measures open to it. Should the government have understood the position and changed course earlier? So, um, and I hope I've been clear about this, I think the decisions based on the scientific advice were completely rational at the time, and I agreed with them. Uh, with hindsight, I would agree with you that we should have uh, uh, imposed them earlier. We should have what, sorry? Uh, sorry, I, so with hindsight, I agree with the proposition you put to me that we should have imposed them earlier. It is obvious that it took a number of weeks for the government to understand the predicament it was in. It took a number of weeks for the whole of government to understand that regardless of the, the, the modelling, the infection fatality rate and the lack of practical means of controlling the virus gave it very little room for manoeuvre. Should not that awareness have taken place come to the government earlier? Um, 
as I say, I thought the decisions were rational uh, at the time, and they are, and having looked back at the record, they are fully in line with the scientific advice uh, that was received. Now, the debate at the time, as I say, there was, I think everyone agreed we were going to have to have more and more uh, restrictions. The debate was about what the right timing was, and the, um, the clear view of uh, Chief Medical Officer and others that there were big downsides, as was proved to be absolutely correct, uh, to our MPI uh, regimes, and therefore uh, going into them at the right time and coming out of them as quickly as possible to minimise, I'll say what is correctly identified as the sort of collateral damage of MPIs and lockdowns was very, uh, uh, very important. And I would say this all seemed, at the time to me, completely rational of the timings of what we did when. I say looking back, I would take different decisions. Not, I mean, obviously I wasn't the decision maker, but I would have um, uh, supported earlier implementation, as you say. By contrast, Sir Christopher, in relation to the second lockdown, your view at the time was that that second lockdown, the lockdown of November 2020, was implemented too late. Yes. Now, uh, to, uh, and I hope I've made this clear in my witness statement. So the issues in March are lack of knowledge and understanding about the virus and taking decisions uh, in uh, you know, considerable uh, uncertainty. Um, that is not the case for the second lockdown. By this point, we have a lot of testing. We know a lot about the virus. We know uh, we're not modelling. We basically know how uh, it goes uh, uh, up and down. And the debates, uh, which I was nothing like so close to, so I'll give the caveat that I was, as it were, watching from DHSC rather than in the room at this point. But the debates in November are not about what is the situation, they're about what is the right strategy. Um, and uh, and that, that's certainly how it looked to us. It was much more, are lockdowns a good idea or not, not what is the timing of a lockdown and what do we know. Now, my point, and uh, I do understand the argument, I don't agree with them, but I understand the arguments from people that lockdowns are more damaged than they uh, do. In that case, that is made. I understand it, don't agree with it. But if you're going to have a lockdown, uh, which we did, um, uh, uh, it would have been much better to do it earlier, in my view. I wasn't the decision taker, but in my view, um, than when we did uh, in uh, November. So I see the decision making very, very differently in that March 1st lockdown, which I say was based on uncertainty, and the second and third ones, which were based on certainty, but disagreements about the right strategy. Do, uh, sorry, does that, that was a long answer, but do, 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 does that make sense? Well, that's not for me to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I have no more questions. Milady, there are a number of real time questions. There are. Ms. Campbell. Um, Sir Christopher, I ask questions on behalf of the Northern Ireland COVID bereaved families. And I want to take you back, please, to <coughs> that period in January and February 2020. And in your um, witness statement, I think it's perhaps your ninth one, you exhibit a document that is ultimately dated the 25th of February 2020. And we're going to have a look at it, if we may. It's INQ uh, 00005120. Whilst it's coming up, Sir Christopher, and because we're um, limited as to time, this is a Public Health England document that is endorsed by your department and it is entitled Guidance, as you can see, for Social Stroke Community Care and Residential Settings. Uh, and if you just look at the very bottom of the first page, you can see it's endorsed and accredited by the Department of Health and Social Care and indeed the Chief Medical Officer. Do you see that? Yes. And as I say, although this version is the uh, 24th of February, it's ultimately published the next day. Um, could we go over the page, please? To page two. Uh, we can see on page two the list of community organisations to which this is to apply. Uh, and the bottom three bullet points, care homes, which are nursing care homes, care home services without nursing, support to people in their own homes. And of course, there are other uh, children's homes, homes for people with learning <coughs> disability and so on. 
Uh, and at the very bottom of page two, the advice on the 25th of February. Uh, that very bottom paragraph, please. This guidance is intended for the current position in the UK where there is currently no transmission of COVID-19 in the community. It is therefore very unlikely that anyone receiving care in a care home or in the community will become infected, okay? So it's very clearly stating right at the end of February that it is very unlikely that those who reside in care homes are going to be infected, much less, of course, seriously ill or die. The, um, before I ask you a question, let's look at a few other pieces of advice that is in this document. Can we go to page six, please? It is reiterated in the top paragraph of page six. Last sentence. It remains very unlikely that people receiving care in care home or the community will become infected. And page 12. Um, at the, uh, just give me one second to make sure I have the right reference. I'm so sorry, I'll read it out to you. I just can't see it as it appears on the screen here. But on page 12, it's repeated. Uh, currently, there is no evidence of transmission of COVID-19 in the United Kingdom, and there is no need to do anything differently in any care setting at present. OK? Now, I'm not going to put it on screen, but your department at the same time in, on the 25th of February 2020 had published a situation report, a daily situation report, and you'll be familiar with those. Isn't that right? Uh, I suspect so, yes. That report indicated that as at the 25th of February, fewer than 6,800 people in the UK had in fact been tested. But of those tested, there were 13 confirmed cases domestically, okay? It also indicated that the situation internationally was that China was experiencing widespread infection causing by that stage some 2,700 deaths. The situation in Italy was rapidly deteriorating and deaths had started and doubled overnight. And of course, the situation in the Diamond Princess was that short of 700 people had become infected, okay? Uh, you've told us um, in your evidence today that as at the end of January of 2020, your department was working on the basis that once the virus leaves China, we're in real trouble. Isn't that right? Um, as we covered earlier, yes. Yes. Why is it then that as at the 25th of February 2020, when the situation internationally was grim and that the virus had arrived domestically, you were telling the care home sector, or at least endorsing the advice, that risks of infection were very unlikely and that there was no need to do anything at the moment? Um, because that was the clinical advice uh, at the time. So um, at this moment, actual infection numbers um, in uh, 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 England, as this was, uh, were believed to be very low indeed. Um, so as I understand it, this is a description of what the situation was at that time. It was not a prediction uh, of the uh, future. So I think everything you've read out, I mean, obviously this was signed off by a number of uh, 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 clinicians, not by me, but I, I think everything that you have read out is entirely consistent with the actual number, uh, believed number of cases in the UK on that date. But, but of course, Sir Christopher, once the virus arrived in the UK, once the virus arrived, you knew and your department knew that we needed to be acting on the reasonable worst case scenario basis. Isn't that right? Well, at this point, um, well, the, the, Sir Christopher, the numbers... I'm, I'm, I'm quoting your evidence from this morning to you. In, in, in terms, so the distinction that I think is important here uh, is between what were our predictions of the future and what was our advice to people to do at that moment uh, in time. So it is completely consistent that 
there may be, as there were at this point, uh, very small numbers in the UK that could be contained, and that our prediction of the, uh, uh, the future, uh, the reasonable worst case scenario of what might happen, might be very high. Those are, I don't see those two things as in contradiction uh, at all. Let's look at it in this way. The, the Diamond Princess had many features that are consistent with care home or residential home features. High occupation, high occupancy, a lot of people sharing facilities, staff going from room to room, and perhaps even demographically an older, uh, an older age group. And we know that by that stage, the Diamond Princess ha had suffered such an infection that 700 people on that ship had been infected, okay? Now, if we put it in, in context, was any consideration given at that point as to whether or not you should be advising care homes that your department was acting on a reasonable worst case scenario and that they may well have to at least prepare to take plans to protect their residents? Um, well, you've um, uh, displayed how this document was put together and who signed it off, and what you've just described was not uh, the clinical advice that we were receiving uh, at the time. Well, can we put up, please, document 47541? And to put it in context, this is a document that comes from Professor Jonathan Van Tam. It is advice that he provided, as he says, to his DHSC colleagues on the 24th of January 2020. And can we please, in that document, um, scroll down uh, to page three? Uh, the heading is Significant Spread and Transmission in the UK. And the um, second paragraph, please. And these are his corrections to a DHSC document. If community transmission occurs in the UK, it, most it is most likely that widespread community transmission would follow on rapidly. This would be a tipping point at which we would cease contact tracing as it, is, it would be uh, no longer possible or no longer a possible or plausible route to stop the virus. So as of the 24th of January, your department was re receiving advice that if community transmission occurs in the UK, it is most likely that widespread community transmission would follow. Were you aware of that advice at the time? Um, yes, and it's completely consistent uh, with uh, what I've said in the rest of this uh, hearing and uh, with what I've just said. Uh, so the key uh, words in that paragraph are if community transmission yes. uh, occurs. Now, at the point that that guidance uh, was put out, uh, there was not evidence of community transmission occurring. As you say, there were, I think, from your... 13, the, 13 cases, cases in the UK. Um, and, um, and from memory, um, uh, they were at that point largely imported cases, and we didn't have evidence of community transmission. So I think the guidance is completely in line with what Professor Van Tam uh, has written, which is not surprising given that, as you showed at the beginning, the um, uh, guidance was signed off uh, by the office of the chief medical officer of which Jonathan Van Tam was a part. So I don't see any inconsistency uh, here. Uh, you say you didn't have evidence of community transmission at that point in time. There had been fewer than 7,000 tests. We had 13 confirmed cases. You knew what had happened internationally. You knew what had happened on the Diamond Princess. Would it not have been safer to operate on the basis that there was at the very least a risk of widespread community transmission starting from around the end of February and continuing well beyond? Um, well, I can only repeat we were acting on the clinical advice that we received at the moment and at, at that time. And I'm sure we will cover this uh, in great detail in future uh, modules. But in essence, there were no non-damaging uh, options uh, uh, here. So it's been widely reported uh, the damage uh, to individuals that um, isolation um, uh, to 
uh, non-pharmaceutical so, interventions, so lockdowns I, I, I'm, have. I'm going to, to so we were acting exactly with the clinical advice that you were quoting. I, I want to move on and ask you um, whether you were aware of an article, again authored by Professor Van Tam, this stage in 2017, in relation to the possibility of an influenza pandemic, in which he said that long-term care facility environments and the vulnerability of their residents provides a setting conducive to the rapid spread of the influenza virus and other respiratory pathogens. And later in the article, he talks about the risk in care homes potentially being explosive. Um, I'm not aware of that article. Do, um, does it follow? It does it follow that insofar as the department endorsed this advice? It did not put together the long the risk to residents in long ter term care facilities, the global picture, uh, and the likelihood of transmission at least moving um, towards being widespread in the UK. Well, I can only say the same thing uh, that I have said in response to previous questions. This was advice clearly signed off uh, by. Uh, the clinicians and the scientific advisors at the time about what the best thing to do was in the very specific circumstances that you've described, where we did not um, have evidence of uh, community transmission and therefore the kinds of things that you're describing uh, were not triggered. I mean, I, I get the point you're making, but my answer is, as it were, the same, that that was the scientific and clinical advice we were receiving at that time. And uh, so the, the advice to those who manage care homes is? do nothing, don't worry, any risk it, is very small. And I think um, at that particular moment in time, um, that has proved to be correct. Now, obviously, later uh, in the pandemic, and, and as I'm sure, I'm sure I will be giving evidence on this in the future module, that position changes completely. But at this particular moment in time, I haven't seen anything to suggest that that advice was uh, uh, incorrect or out of line with our scientific advice at that time. Sir Christopher, one more topic, if I may, because I'm sure I've overrun my time. Can we please put up INQ 00106319? Uh, this is a paper produced, again, by your department. Uh, we understand on the 31st of March 2020, you can see it's PPE guideline comparison. And can we go quickly, please, to page two? Uh, there will be a great deal of other evidence in this module and indeed in future modules about uh, procurement of PPE. But on the 31st of March, <coughs> your department was proposing under the intensive care column on the right hand side that to deal with the problem of a lack of PPE or a risk of lack of PPE, FPP3 respirators which had been recommended to be one per patient interaction, was to be changed uh, and those who work in intensive care were to wear one over the course of two hours. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, and you would accept, no doubt, that that would mean many patient interactions and indeed colleague interactions potentially um, within I'm that two hours. At, um, um, I should say I am not an expert uh, in infection control at all. So um, I, I'm not asking you for your expertise in infection control, but you do know that those who work within intensive care facilities may well encounter several patients and several colleagues over a two hour period. Yes. And if we go down, please, to gloves, one per patient interaction is to be proposed to be changed to one per two hours. So again, those who work in those uh, intensive care um, circumstances are to be wearing a single pair of gloves per two hours. And in relation to surgical theatre gowns, one per patient interaction is to be changed to one per four hours. Do you see that? Yes. Were, so far as you know, ministers told that PPE, in order to prevent a crisis in availability, was going to have to be worn for longer and worn for multiple patient and colleague interactions in order to extend its usage. Sorry, were ministers? Yes. It? 
Yes, they were aware of that. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, this was um, uh, this was being uh, widely debated. It was very high up our uh, uh, issues list. We were very worried about it, and um, uh, I think um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to go away and check and give you the answer afterwards. But I think at this point, um, ministers are holding several meetings a week on. PPE, well, possibly daily, so I, th I, I, I think they were very well cited. Uh, were you aware issues. whether the proposals made in this document were the result of any UK trials having been undertaken to test whether they were safe, I, both for patients and staff? I couldn't tell you. Now, um, well, uh, Those are all my questions. Uh, Fred, Thank you. Uh, it, it's not in your thought, Ms Campbell, but we have really, we've got another witness to get through this afternoon, so I'm sorry to interrupt you. Mr Metzer. My lady, I've been asked and I've agreed to limit my questions further um, in light of the position today. Um, so, Christopher, I asked some questions on behalf of the long COVID groups. On the 17th of July 2020, it was confirmed by email that the, D the DHSC had plans to raise public awareness about the long-term effects of COVID-19. But it was only on the 21st of October 2020 that the DHSC finally launched its one and only video on, on dis indiscriminate risk of long COVID, which was directed at young people. Why was there a delay of over, over three months in publishing the single awareness raising video on long COVID? Um, I don't know about uh, the video, I can go and check, but there have been a lot of activity on uh, uh, long COVID uh, before uh, that, going back to the 5th of June, uh, when the NHS issued its first uh, guidance on the aftercare needs uh, of inpatients recovering from COVID-19, and then the Secretary of State uh, holds a round table on long COVID on the 1st of uh, July. So we were well aware of the issue. Mm. And I should say, uh, as it hasn't come up before, it's a very serious issue that we take very uh, uh, seriously. But um, as I say, I don't know about the video, I can find well, out, but there okay. was a lot of activity on long COVID before the dates you're okay. describing. Okay. Uh, leave this video aside. There was no reason, was there, to delay the accompanying press release? Uh, again, I couldn't tell you. I can find out. Yes, please. Do you agree that this one public health video over three years was insufficient to warn people, including parents, of both the symptoms of long COVID and that long COVID is caused from infection of COVID-19? Um, I think if uh, the uh, video had been the one thing that had happened, I would agree with you. But as I've said, there was an awful lot of other activity uh, on uh, long COVID. Uh, from when it became apparent after the first wave that this was going to be an important thing for the uh, uh, country and for uh, uh, its sufferers. So, I, I mean, I'm terribly sorry, I can't, can't really focus on the video because um, right. I don't... I'll ask you a more general question. Do you agree overall that the information provided was insufficient to warn people, including parents, of two things, the symptoms of long COVID and the, cause of, uh, the fact that long COVID is caused from infection by COVID-19? Um, no, I, no, I don't. I mean, um, there are other witnesses from my department and related who it will be, your questions will be better answered uh, than particularly the clinicians. Um, my, my, my impression is that actually we and our colleagues in the NHS were very front-footed uh, about long COVID, both in terms of its research and what we put in place uh, around uh, its treatment. Uh, I'm sure more is needed. Um, as I say, this is a very um, uh, significant uh, uh, thing. But I don't, um, so certainly from what I have seen, I haven't seen either a lack of focus or a, um, uh, uh, a lack of action on this important uh, issue. Um, please, we put up uh, uh, 61266, uh, bottom of page two and the top of page three under item five. Uh, eight months later, after uh, the video, the DHSC con convened the Long COVID Oversight Board with other government departments to coordinate the whole of government activity and policy development. We can see from these minutes of the first meeting in June 2021 that ES, who I'm assuming is Ed Scully, 
uh, raised concern that there was a gap on the broader government view of long COVID and how that was being communicated. Why at this point had the DHSC still not implemented a communication strategy for long COVID? Um, I think, well, there was a lot of communication about long COVID. I think the point, and I think you're correct that it's Ed Scully, I think the point he's making here um, is about the, um, the cross-government uh, nature of the communications as opposed to that done directly by the NHS. I think that's the point. I mean, again, I'm sorry, I don't know the story of this in the detail that your questions uh, require. So, again, on some of these, I'll take your questions away and come back if that's OK well, with a more detailed and more expert answer. Well, you certainly agree that the DHSC hadn't implemented a communication strategy by that point. Um, well, I, as I say, I think what Ed is talking about, but I need to go away and... Um, uh, uh, check uh, is about the cross-government wider implications. I mean, my understanding is there was a lot of communication being done uh, by the NHS, as it were, on the street clinical issues in the way that we do for all conditions. I think he's making a point about the wider government. Uh, but as I say, I'll check and give you a uh, better informed answer Thank than you. I can give today. Do you know whether the discussions of the Long COVID Oversight Board fed into Cabinet Office messaging on Long COVID? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I know that my ministers, and particularly at this point, I think it was Lord Bethel, took a very keen interest uh, in uh, Long COVID. So I know it was a very important thing uh, within the department with a lot of escalation. Uh, and obviously the NHS, as I'm sure you know, uh, have done an awful lot in this area. I couldn't tell you what was um, uh, put to Cabinet Office. Right. Do you know whether there was a Cabinet Office strategy on public messaging of the risk of developing long COVID from COVID-19 infections, either in June 2021 or at any time since? Um, again, I don't know, but I'll find out. Okay, thank you. Uh, you've said in your evidence today that advice to the public on how to behave are non-pharmaceutical interventions designed to stop the spread of the virus. Do you agree that the public had the right to know about the risk of long COVID so they could protect themselves from it? Um, yes, and I think um, whatever we knew and the NHS knew about long COVID was put into the public uh, domain. I don't think there's a point when we have information that we don't share. Um, again, I'll have to go and um, uh, check with my experts on this and confirm, but I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm not aware there was ever a delay in, as it were, our scientists knowing something about long COVID and that being made public. But as again, I, once again, I'll have to check. Thank you. Uh, on the 5th of June, 2020... Sorry, Mr. Metzger, I'm afraid, I mean, I think if you've, if you've got questions... It sounds as if this witness can't really answer them and that he could put them into writing. Yeah, I mean, if you would like to write, I, I'd be absolutely delighted to get somebody much more expert than me to... Um... Well, my lady, I but have... We'll go with that last question. Make this the last one, Mr. Metzger. All right, thank you, you And anything much. else we'll put into writing. Thank right? you very much, my lady. Uh, on the 5th of June 2020, I'll say it as speedily as I can, the DHSC identified longer-term sequelae of COVID-19 as one of four major implications for the health and care system in the presentation. Uh, I'm not going to cite it, you probably know it. Despite the DHSC's concern about this, you say in your witness statements you can't recall that the risk of long COVID was taken into account for decisions taken in relation to the second and third lockdowns. Do uh, you yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, that's factually true. Um, I don't think uh, those lockdown uh, decisions, I think they were taken on the basis of um, uh, the... Um, uh, the hospitalisation rate, the spread of the disease and the likely death rate. I think those were the three big conversations. Now, I, I should emphasise that doesn't mean that long COVID was not being taken seriously. It's just in the context of, as it were, a very extreme measure that a national lockdown is. I don't think that long COVID was one of the considerations. It was certainly important to the government, but I don't, as far as I know, the decision makers were not doing it on the, that basis. Um, I'm going to reduce the question still further, um, and we will probably do a fuller request in writing. Thank you. Um, do you agree that there was a difference in, in approach to long COVID between the DHSC and Cabinet Office? 
Um, I'm, I'll check. Uh, I'm not aware that there was. Um, you would expect uh, the Department of Health and the NHS uh, to have a focus on a medical condition that was much greater than that of Cabinet Office with all its responsibilities. Um, I don't think that so you'd expect much more from us than them. I don't think... I'm not aware that there was ever a disagreement between us and them on this subject. All right. So, so final... There, Mr. Metz, I'm sorry. Thank you, my lady. Um, anything else will have to be in writing. Mr. Dale, I'm afraid I'm going to have to be very strict with you as well, and then Mr. Menon, because uh, we have another entire witness to go. Mr. Dale. Uh, Sir Christopher, I ask questions on behalf of FEMO. That's the Federation of Ethnic Minority Healthcare Organizations. And I have uh, three hopefully very brief uh, topics that I wish to deal with you. Uh, firstly, were there specific considerations or actions, targeted interventions, if you will, that were pursued to identify and address the additional support needs of black, Asian, and minority ethnic healthcare workers during the pandemic? Um, yes, uh, uh, yes, there were. Um, I do think this is an area where we uh, uh, learned a lot and ramped up uh, our activity uh, uh, accordingly. Uh, the two biggest things I would uh, point you to uh, is the, um, uh, the CMO and SAGE commissioned PHE study done by uh, Professor Fenton and others in April 2020, uh, specifically on uh, to, uh, these, uh, uh, these issues. Uh, and then uh, the development of the QCOVID uh, tool commissioned in May 2020 uh, that was trying to take a much more individualised uh, approach to assessing people's risks, including not just their clinical risks, but their uh, socio-economic uh, 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 risks as well. I think those were probably, certainly in the early stages, those are probably the two biggest uh, things I would point you to. Second topic how did the DHSC respond to the concerns and experiences of black, Asian, and minority ethnic healthcare workers regarding PPE uh, and the recommendations issued by the Public Accounts Committee on February, uh, in February 2021, uh, which included, and I quote, uh, improving understanding of the experience of frontline staff, particularly focusing on those from different ethnic backgrounds. Um, I'll have to check what exactly we did. Uh, oh, sorry. Right, yes, <laughs> talking the wrong way, sorry. Um, I'll have to check exactly what we did with that specific recommendation. We report to the PAC on their recommendations quite regularly, so there will be a published report of what we did uh, with that uh, specific uh, recommendation. Uh, on the general, um, and I think we've set this out in our witness statements, so I won't repeat, there was a uh, basically escalating action to deal with the very important issues uh, that you raise. And um, my, certainly my understanding is we moved from a position where we had not very much understanding of these important issues to having a much greater understanding and that significant action uh, was uh, taken. Thank you. And my third and final topic, uh, uh, this question arises from WhatsApp messages between yourself and, and Lord Mark Sedwell uh, on the 25th of March 2020 regarding PPE. Uh, and the reference, and it's not necessary to, to bring it up, the reference is INQ triple zero two seven nine nine one eight in that exchange Lord Sedwell writes at 531 stories like this in, in in telegraph in the telegraph like likely to come up nurses in near revolt as some use bin liners to protect themselves and my question is from your vantage point, what would you say was done to ensure that PPE provided was suitable uh, to fit and properly protect all staff, including uh, black, Asian, and minority ethnic healthcare workers? Um, well, that is a, 
get it wrong again. Uh, that's a uh, uh, that's a huge uh, uh, question that would require a very very uh, uh, detailed answer. We have, and I think as we said earlier, there's an entire module uh, on uh, procurement, including PPE, and I think it would probably uh, I. I, I I think the, the substantialness of that question demands more than a, uh, a sort of um, a few seconds answer. So I think it would probably be better, if that's OK, to answer that question in the module that's devoted to it. We'll have to come back to it, Mr Dale. Sorry. Very well. Thank you. Mr Menon. The evidence of Sir Christopher today and reflected further, we have no questions. Thank you, Mr. Mellon. We aim to please, my lady. We aim to please. I think you just made yourself one of the most popular people in the room, Mr. Mellon. <laughs> <coughs> I'm really sorry that we've had to cut people short. I know Mr. Metzer wanted to ask more questions, but I'm sure we can get the answers that you seek, even if um, maybe if at another stage we can read them out if we get them, if that helps, Mr. Metzer. So thank you very much, Sir Christopher. I fear, that, as you've envisaged, that this isn't the last time I'm, we shall meet. I suspect not. So, Thank you. Um, I'm now going to keep quiet. Everybody else is going to keep quiet while we do the handover for the next witness so the stenographer can rest her fingers. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Can you give us your full name, please? My name is Yvonne Doyle. Thank you. Um, Professor Doyle, you uh, provided at our request, um, a, a witness statement for the inquiry. Uh, we can see the first page of it uh, is on screen now. Um, we don't need to look at the last page, but you uh, have signed uh, that last page of the document below a statement indicating that you believe the contents of the statement are true um, with the date of the 17th of October this year. Um, it, are the contents of the statement true, Professor? Yes. Thank you. Professor, you um, set out uh, some considerable detail about your career um, in that witness statement. Um, in summary, uh, it's right, isn't it, that you are by training a medical doctor? Yes. Um, you, you have uh, acquired a range of qualifications over your career, uh, and indeed you have held uh, a series of appointments in the field of public health. Yes. Um, it, that includes um, a, a series of roles um, acting as a, a director of public health for various local and regional authorities in England. Yes. Uh, in, in June 2019, you were appointed as the medical director and director of health protection uh, for the organisation Public Health England, or PHE. Yes. From February to July... 2020, uh, you were PHE's uh, senior responsible officer um, for 
the input of your organisation uh, into uh, the response to the COVID pandemic. Yes. Um, and I think it's right that you remained in post at PHE until that organisation was uh, dissolved in October 2021. Yes. Um, and, and you then became the Director for Public Health at NHS England, um, and you stayed in that role until you retired earlier this year. Yes. Um, Professor, as with um, other witnesses today, um, we will be asking you questions relating uh, to PHE's uh, involvement with the pandemic, um, but we will do so conscious that many of those issues um, touch on much broader areas um, that will be the subject of further examination by the inquiry at further modules, in particular um, issues relating to test and trace and also uh, PPE. Uh, and so we will be endeavouring today to ask you questions around the interface, if you like, between the activity of PHE and core political and administrative decision making during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, before we before we get into those issues, uh, can you give us, Professor, a, a brief outline, first of all, of in general terms, PHE and, and what it did um, back in, in in the days when it existed, um, and more specifically, its role in relation to combating infectious disease. Yes. Uh PHE was remitted to undertake four main functions. The protection of the population, including the um, uh, instigation and uh, uh, curation of specialist, service, specialist infection services, particularly laboratories. The um, oversight and the uh, implementation of programmes on uh, well-being and health improvement of the population. Uh, the um, surveillance of disease and the curation of various disease registers, the support to the NHS, particularly on the reduction of inequalities in the NHS, but also on value and support to clinicians. And finally, the uh, um, development and ensuring of the uh, development of the workforce in public health. So I think it's clear from what you've said that where there is a, a novel infectious disease that needs to be uh, combated in this country, um, that can engage several or perhaps even all of those areas that you just described. Yes, and you asked about its particular role in infectious diseases, uh, where there were several sub-functions, uh, first being the uh, um, oversight and uh, man management and running of the specialist laboratories, the um, uh, development and the um, execution of field services for the control of outbreaks, the uh, running of the emergency service, uh, training and testing, uh, training particularly and exercising. And then specialist areas in radiation, chemicals and environmental health, uh, which were based at Chiltern. Now, we, we've said, Professor, that your role that you were appointed to in 2019 um, at PHE was that of medical director and Director of Health Protection. Um, give us a sense of the scope of your duties in that role. Well, the organisation had changed somewhat. It's in my statement uh, that before uh, 2018, the whole in, uh, um, health protection service encompassed both the national infection service, the laboratories and the field services um, and health protection teams. Uh, and then um, also the chemicals, radiation and environment services and an important surveillance service, which I should have mentioned actually as part of its core health protection function. Now, in 2019, that changed in the appointment of a national infection service director. And my role uh, remained as the health protection director and medical director but my responsibilities for health protection were mainly to oversee the whole, that the whole system held together. We cooperated. 
for health protection, but also specifically to manage the chemicals, radiation, environment and emergency planning services. I see. Could we look briefly at paragraph eight of your statement, please, Professor? It's on page three. Um, you you yes. describe in this paragraph, in the six months or so after you joined PHG, having to deal with a series of outbreaks of other diseases. We're talking um, before 2020 now, so not COVID, um, but as listed here, uh, listeria, what was then called monkeypox, but which we've been told is now mpox, and also Lassa fever. Now, I don't want to spend a great deal of time talking about other disease outbreaks, Professor, but it, it may be that dealing with those outbreaks was more typical of the work that PHE regularly undertook in those days than COVID, which we'll come to talk about. If that's right, can you just give us a sense um, of the work um, that uh, PHE undertook on those issues in 2019? That's correct. So these would be the more spectacular end of health protection outbreaks or uh, emergencies. There were 10,000 incidents a year that uh, the Health Protection Service looked after as well, which were much more local. Many of them actually did relate to um, areas that uh, were affected eventually by COVID. These were very special outbreaks. They absorbed a lot of resource. The Listeria outbreak, um, sadly, uh, eight patients died in the NHS, but the complexity of what we had to deal with there in terms of the food chains that we were dealing with was uh, immense and took a lot of time. It took about eight weeks, really, for that whole instant to uh, work its way through, and there was still work afterwards. Mpox at the time, monkeypox, was one case uh, again, very complex case, needed a lot of contact tracing. Um, dozens of people had to be contacted on a travel basis. Uh, and it also called up the elements of the high consequence infectious disease work. And then the repatriation, interestingly, again, recurred during the pandemic because we did have to get very involved with repatriations early in the pandemic. So these, um, in many ways, they were spectacular but not typical. What they showed me was that we were running very hot at the end of 2019. We were very busy and uh, this was just the, the thin end of a very large wedge of outbreaks. Right. Um, that takes us then to 2020. Um, you describe in your statement um, PHE being first informed of a potentially serious threat of pandemic on the 2nd of January 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, and can we take it that that triggered um, early investigative work um, at PHE? Yes. So, in fact, um, I was informed on New Year's Eve by our on-call instant director that uh, he was concerned that there were problems in China and that this could have implications for our ports. Uh, but we um, certainly from our reports coming from uh, the WHO and elsewhere, we alerted uh, DH and CMO on, early in January on a precautionary basis, yes. Um, a little further on in your statement, you describe how in the following weeks, January and going into February, I think, um, PHE developed a test for this new strain, what we know as COVID-19. Um, that, that we see referenced in other documents has been recognised as one of the early successes of PHE um, in terms of combating the virus. Um, can you explain in a few sentences how that came about? Yes, the test uh, was developed uh, in PHE based and using the learning from MERS uh, in 2012 and indeed uh, developed uh, on a, a multiple platform of um, uh, uh, viruses and uh, was able to be stood up really for um, uh, clinical use by the end of January, which was rapid by the scale of this, given how novel it was and that the actual genomic um, recipe for it really had only appeared in January. That was because we had expert virology, um, which is part of our function, is to to maintain 
an, an expert uh, um, infection service. Uh, was that work done by you alone, or, or, or was it? Uh, were the, was, did it involve international cooperation of any sort? It certainly involved international cooperation, but uh, the UK, through PHE, was a, an important contributor to that. The recipe had come through China. Uh, WHO uh, and GISED had been able to share that. And there was very quick cooperation with uh, a number of countries, uh, including the UK, Germany, the USA, uh, to get this test functioning. Now, you mentioned, I think it was in the context of MPOX, uh, this uh, HCID, as you put it, mm. um, which stands, doesn't it, for High Consequence Infectious Disease. Yes. Uh, and in your statement, you refer to the fact that COVID-19 was designated as an HCID at a very early stage on the 10th of January uh, 2020. C can you um, explain to us, please, what, what that, first of all, what that uh, designation means, but also what consequences went with it? Yes. So high consequence infectious diseases are designated um, uh, on the basis of a number of criteria. First and foremost, a high case fatality rate. So a lot of people who get this will, will die. That's the assumption that it spreads, particularly in healthcare settings, but it spreads fairly rapidly. It's difficult to detect and it needs a very complicated enhanced response. Uh, so it would be appropriate entirely for a novel virus of this nature to be designated in this way. The consequent, and it was decided by the four countries, actually, the, there is a standing four country infectious disease group of clinicians. Just, just pause there a moment. Is that because as early as the 10th of January, you knew that COVID had all of those characteristics? Or was it done on a precautionary basis? It was done on a precautionary basis. We didn't know all of that. But on the other hand, and there was very little information to go on at that time. However, on a precautionary basis, the four countries decided this was the right thing to do. Did, did it become apparent over the weeks, maybe months that followed, that in fact it, COVID did not warrant um, that uh, classification? Yes, so here was the first balance decision, really. Um, so we were still learning about the virus, but by the 28th of February, there were other consequences, as you've asked. For instance, high consequence infectious diseases require a certain category of lab, a category three lab, which means they're very contained and very limited. And, and that's correct. And also only people, certain people who are trained to deal with them because they may be very dangerous to staff. That dreadfully limits the number of laboratories that can actually engage in this. So um, given that we felt that it was more important to have a, a, variety, you know, a huge um, influx of uh, other help into the laboratory system, we uh, applied, the four countries applied to um, de-escalate this to a category two. And that had to go through a number of, it had to go through a number of committees to escalate and it had to go through those committees to de-escalate. Um, we don't need to get into the detail of that process, Professor, but I think you say it, it was, uh, was it on the, the, the 16th of March that in fact the, that process was complete and COVID was de-escalated so that it was no longer had that classification? Yes, that's correct. Um, and as you say, the practical consequence of that was that whereas previously only a very small number of perhaps your high uh, sort of security, if you like, laboratories were, were allowed to do COVID work, once the disease had been declassified, it became possible for a, a far larger number of more routine laboratories to work on the disease, including testing. Correct. Um, we're going to come to the, to the question of testing in a moment, but since we're on this subject, um, <coughs> in the uh, diaries that we have that were written by the uh, government chief scientific advisor, Patrick Vallance, uh, there's an entry, I'm not going to bring it up on screen, I'll, I'll read it out. There's an entry on, on the 2nd of April of 2020, so within a, a couple of weeks of the disease being 
declassified, um, where he refers to Crick, and I think that that's a, the Crick mm -hmm. Laboratories, mm -hmm. having offered 300 <coughs> scientists, uh, and in his words, and got no response from PHE, uh, crazy. That's that was his words. Um, was there a, a, an offer from the Crick Laboratories to provide 300 of their scientists or perhaps laboratory space to assist you um, dealing with COVID at that stage? Yes, there was. Uh, not to me personally, but there was to uh, senior uh, in, um, executives in PHE. And as far as I'm aware, it was welcome. Uh, however, there were issues about how testing could proceed on an end-to-end -end basis. This, by the way, is not a comment about the Crick at all. But in general, every laboratory wanted to help, small laboratories of every kind. And what they needed to be able to offer was a, a, a system of accruing the tests, doing the tests, which they were offering, and then getting the tests back out through usually the NHS, but elsewhere into the community or whatever so that there was what we called an end-to-end -end service, so that the test was taken and the patient got the response they needed. Now, as I understand it, not all laboratories could do that either. And the first uh, group of partners who could were the NHS laboratories, and they were recruited pretty quickly by our National Infection Service directors. Uh, but eventually, the whole testing arrangements really expanded pretty quickly, actually, after a seminar on the 17th of March. Um, well, we'll come back to the question of testing shortly, Professor, but thank you for that. Um, I want to move on to a slightly different subject, and it's one that we have, uh, the inquiry at least, has considered already today, and that is Operation Nimbus, which I know you have at least some familiarity with. Could we look, please, at a document? It's a set of COBRA minutes, um, INQ 56226. Um, Professor, I had intended to ask you previously, um, were you um, someone who attended either COBRA meetings or SAGE meetings during this period? I did attend COBRA meetings, but not this one, to no. my knowledge. If you look over the page, in fact, onto the second page of this document, we can see that it was someone called Nick Finn uh, from Public Health England. Yes. Um, can we take it that routinely there would have been someone at COBRA meetings from Public Health England? Usually. Uh, it depended on, the obviously, what the um, orientation of the meeting was. But in the period of the pandemic... Uh, usually there was somebody, but I have to say possibly not at every COBRA meeting. Um, but you say on occasions it was you, but as we can see, not this time. Not this time. We've looked at this set of minutes for a, a number of different reasons. Um, this time, can we go please to... I think it's page eight. It's the last page. Yes. So here is the set of actions from the meeting. Mm -hmm. And if we look at point seven we see Public Health England to develop and run a ministerial tabletop exercise within the fortnight to consider the range of decisions that may be required in the event of a reasonable worst case scenario. Um, so there is a tasking to Public Health England to conduct, as it is said, an exercise. Was that something that, at least within this type of series of events, was unusual or, or, or exceptional? No, it wasn't. Uh, the uh, COBRA and government were, at, uh, were obviously um, at will to uh, ask anything of PHE that was in its remit, and exercising was. So uh, in this case, um, that uh, inquiry, that uh, commission, would have been taken through into Public Health England. Um, we know that um, what followed from this instruction was indeed Operation Nimbus, which took place on the 12th of February, so just inside the fortnight. Mm -hmm. um, were you involved in organising Operation Nimbus yourself, Professor? No, I wasn't. Um, I, perhaps we can take it then that you weren't there personally. I wasn't there, but my team would have supported the running of the exercise. 
um, and I know that you have at least some familiarity with what happened um, yes. on that occasion. Um, we've seen the slides that were prepared for Operation Nimbus, the reasonable worst case scenario, the, uh, the, the synopsis, the scenario being a wave in which uh, 800 odd thousand people would die mm -hmm. in uh, a 16 week period, I think it was. Um, are you able to help us um, with who attended uh, the, the tabletop exercise, Professor? I'm not able to give you exact names, I'm afraid. Uh, I know that the NHS, that the Department for Health and uh, uh, senior public health uh, uh, members of PHE were involved, possibly PHE, on a basis of running the exercise. Uh, and the Cabinet Office would have been, because the Cabinet Office actually took the commission and required PHE to run the exercise. That, that would not be unusual. And when you say commission there, you, you simply mean they were the ones who, as we've seen from these uh, minutes, as it were, instructed or asked PHE to, to undertake that exercise? Yes. Could we look at another document, please? Um, it's INQ 273915. This is, in fact, a document which I think PHE have helpfully provided, possibly today, certainly very recently. Yes, yes thank you. And I know you're familiar with this document, mm -hmm. Professor. Um, this is a, a summary note, as we see on exercise Nimbus, um, and it, it says novel coronavirus preparation, but I think it's clear from the content of the note that it was prepared after the exercise had happened. Is that right? Correct. Um, if we can look um, well, briefly at page two, uh, there is a very short and high-level description of um, what the exercise was about, its aims, objectives, uh, format. Um, and then going on to page three, please, uh, there is a, a description of the scenario, which really just reflects what we've already seen in the slides. There's a very brief um, reference to participants. We see 55 people, including 10 to 15 ministers. Um, we, it appears that people, representatives from the devolved administrations were there. Mm -hmm. Are you able to help us, perhaps not from your knowledge, but who would you have expected from the devolved administrations to have attended an exercise like this? I would expect very senior administrators and uh, ministerial uh, presence as well. Um, I cannot say who was at this meeting, I'm afraid. And I uh, understand that the Cabinet Office retained that information uh, as we speak. Um, and just then finally on this document, we see under actions, it says Cabinet Office circulated findings internally and implemented the appropriate actions. Professor, the inquiry uh, in Module 1 has seen the documents relating to exercise called Cygnus, which took place some time mm -hmm. before the pandemic. And uh, there are very detailed um, ex post documents prepared, um, learnings, recommendations, um, describing what took place at the exercise and everything that flowed from it. Would you have expected um, something detailed by way of report or recommendations to emerge from this exercise? Yes, and that would be a normal outcome from, uh, well, output really, from uh, something like this. The report might be written by our emergency planning team, but the recommendations would be agreed with the commissioner and the implementation would be assigned to uh, respon the responsible body who, in this case, would have been the commissioner as well. The, the com you've referred to the commissioner, but the, you mean? I mean the cabinet office in this case. In other exercises, if I could explain just to be helpful, uh, recommendations can often be delegated to the most appropriate body within, the, within government or the NHS to implement. So, so can we take it at least that PHE has no further material no detailed uh, summary of the exercise, no detailed recommendations from it, and that if we, if we were to look for such material, we would need to ask the Cabinet Office and 
perhaps the Contingencies Secretariat. As I understand it, that's correct. All right. Um, well, I, I won't ask you any further questions about that, um, Professor. Thank you. Um, lastly, on this early period, January, February, can we look, please, at paragraph 98 of your statement? It's on page 33. Um, Professor, you, you state here that your main concern in late January, February 2020 was that your situational awareness advice was not always welcome. You say that this led to a distancing for a period from offering direct advice, and you add that it was never clear which parties were most offended and why, a situation you say you encountered when professional information was presented in good faith to inform the public. And you also say there was general confusion and increasing concern as to who was in charge in government and why delays were occurring in getting, for example, key guidance documents out to the public. Mm -hmm. um, it's our fault, I'm sure, but that's all quite vague. Can you put some detail onto exactly what these concerns that you had in this period were? Well, they encompass a number of issues which um, were concerning to me. Um, the first was uh, it, it, what I'm relating to here in terms of the distancing, and this is put on paper really to explain that there was a distance between the end of January and quite a bit of February, actually, between myself and ministers, particularly the Secretary of State. Just pause um, there for a moment. Yeah. Which Secretary of State? Uh, the Secretary of State for Health. Uh, and it followed uh, a media interview I had done uh, at the end of January where I uh, said straight that there could well be cases in the country, which, of course, there were about 10 days later, uh, and that we were unclear about, uh, but were prepared to consider that asymptomatic um, uh, uh, infection could occur, very unclear about transmission at that point, and that it would take possibly six months for a vaccine to be developed. I was rather, um, I think, optimistic about that. Um, this, was, this, this does not go down well, I'm afraid. It may well have been my presentation or the way I, I uh, did that interview or those sets of interviews, but I felt it was the truth. I was telling the truth. The way that was uh, handled was that I was advised not to do any further media uh, and that the Secretary of State would need to clear all media, which, of course, we agreed to but also that it was probably best if I just kept a distance for a while until things settled down, which I did. did you describe the press interviews on a particular day. Did you meet the uh, Secretary of State on that day, or, or were you simply told that he was uh, not happy with what you'd done? No, I did meet the Secretary of State on that day, and he did make his displeasure clear. Uh, in what way? Um, he asked me not to patronise him. Um, what did you reply? Well, I apologised, actually. I remember my words. I said, I really am sorry if you think the science has let you down. Did, did you think that you'd let him down, Professor? I did, in that our ethos always is to support um, our ministers, and this was not a good outcome. So I did feel I had let him down in some way, but I still felt I had spoken the truth. From what you've said, you weren't trying uh, to do anything that would either let the Secretary of State down or indeed anything other than promote the objectives of Public Health England and the Department for Health. Absolutely. So what was then the aftermath of this uh, incident? I didn't make any fuss about it. Uh, I continued with my job, as, uh, and I was asked to be SRO uh, in mid-February to do various uh, elements of the internal management of uh, the incident in Public Health England, and I just continued with my work. Uh, 
I did eventually uh, stand on platforms in Downing Street and did media in March and right up to uh, April and indeed one episode in May. So it did resolve. But I think you've said that you were told either by Mr Hancock or others that you shouldn't have any direct contact with him for a period of time after this incident. Not quite. I was advised uh, by um, uh, colleagues in the civil service that this would be the best way to calm things down. And I understood that and I complied. But this was at a time when, you tell us, but perhaps you would have expected to have quite frequent contact with, with the Secretary of State given the developing pandemic. Yes, and had had actually very frequent contact uh, up to 2020. Were there things that you would otherwise have wanted to say to the Secretary of State that you felt you couldn't during that period? No, because there were good colleagues who were able to convey that and deputies stepped in. So we managed <coughs> to continue the work and I really felt that the public population should not suffer in any way because of this and therefore we found ways to continue the work. Yes. Lady, I'm about to move to another topic. I think you had intended to take one more short break. Um, if, if you were, now would be a good time. Right. Um, very well, five minutes, no more. All right. Mr. Professor, I want to move back to the question of test, trace and isolate. Uh, and it's right, of course, that contact tracing is a fundamental weapon against the spread of a, an infectious disease. I think it was the MPOX uh, disease in 2019 where you, you, you indicated that there had been quite a, a significant degree of contact tracing uh, on that occasion. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's also right, isn't it, that... Um, viruses such as COVID-19, uh, where patients are infectious um, um, at the pre-symptomatic stage, uh, are viruses where contact tracing can be particularly important? Yes. Um, generally speaking, um, is there a point at the development um, of, a, of a disease, of a virus, uh, where contact tracing ceases to be effective? Yes, it is actually difficult to identify people at pre-symptomatic uh, stage if they're in if they're the first case, of course. But contact tracing works best when there are low numbers of cases, particularly in community settings, because it's then uh, quite reasonable to be able to follow each one and really put the fire out, that's what Contain is about, is stop an outbreak from spreading. When there are large numbers of cases, it becomes difficult logistically, but it also becomes probably impossible to contain. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, but the, the first point is that with small numbers of cases, the hope is that you can actually extinguish the virus at that point from contacting. What we were looking for and what became very important is where it was clear that there were cases that were second, called second, third, fourth generation, in other words, contacts of contacts of contacts, which were out there which didn't have a known link to what we understood uh, were the sources of the virus in the community. And that happened predominantly at the end of February. First case was the 28th of February. Yeah. Now, you refer to, to, to February and COVID. We know that the World Health Organization issued a very clear uh, encouragement, test, test, test. Mm -hmm. um, there was a suggestion made um, by Jenny Harris, the, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, um, in March 2020, um, that 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 guidance, the need for testing, was something that didn't necessarily apply to this country. I mean, the, the, the term she used was that uh, it was guidance that was really for less developed countries. Is there any force in that at all? 
It wasn't a um, strategy that we pursued in Public Health England. Uh, we, our view was that we would pursue the strategy that we had laid out quite clearly, which was to identify and contain as many cases as possible and all their contacts. Um, as you say, at the very outset of the pandemic, that's exactly what Public Health England sought to do. Um, but of course, we know um, that the pandemic um, became far, far larger as those early weeks and months progressed. Um, and what we saw later in 2020 was a, a population level attempt um, mm -hmm. at, a, at a program of testing and contact tracing. Um, and if we can look, please, at paragraph 26 of your statement at, at page 9. Do you make the point here, um, Professor, that that type of contact tracing exercise was something uh, for which PHE simply hadn't been uh, designed or funded? That's correct. For large-scale uh, contact tracing, it hadn't. And incidentally, the scale of that became clearer later in the pandemic when there were attempts to recruit 18,000 people to contact trace. So that was the scale of what we would have to deal with in a widespread infection within the population. Uh, but to answer your question at this point, Public Health England was still committed to doing everything it could to find every case and contact that it, it could within its capacity. And its capacity was still extant. It was still in existence in mid-March. Um, let, let's look at um, a, a set of SAGE minutes, um, Professor. If we can go to 52098, please. Um, we, we can note, Professor, that this is a, a set of minutes for a meeting that took place in February 2020. Yes. Um, but just underneath, we see it was these were net minutes were published some months later in May. Do you see that? Yes. Much smaller writing. Yes. Uh, and the inquiry has heard that in February it wasn't com it was not practice, was it, to publish these minutes? But steps were taken. Indeed. Um, some time later to publish them, and th mm -hmm. that's why we see the, the difference there. Uh, and there has been some debate about uh, an entry um, on, uh, I think it's page two of the um, minutes, yes, um, casting our eyes just briefly up the list, up that page we see that there seem to have been two people there from PHE, Sharon Peacock and Maria Zambon, but mm -hmm. not you. Not me. Um, but at paragraph seven, as I say, there is an entry which states, we'll recall this was mid-February, currently PHE can cope with five new cases a week requiring isolation of 800 contacts. Modelling suggests this capacity could be in in increased to 50 new cases a week, 8,000 contact isolations, uh, but this assumption needs to be stress tested. Um, was that correct, Professor? Uh, it wasn't quite correct. I understand what it may have been trying to convey. So the five was five introductions, uh, and these were introductions from abroad. They were not, not five cases in country. There were five introductions. The paper on which it was based was a modelling paper which looked at a pooled set of data from several European countries and looked at the genetic variation and the uh, likelihood of uh, onward contacts in this group of uh, uh, people. And the, so the paper was suggesting that five contacts, sorry, I beg your pardon, five introductions would lead to, um, in each case, the, uh, each generation for each case up to a fourth generation would lead to thousands of contacts. So it was a, a proposition that this would rapidly get out of control. It was basically saying multiple generations will yield very rapid numbers of contacts very quickly because 
of what is known about the transmissibility of this virus. Unfortunately, that got translated into popular narrative as Public Health England can only cope with five cases a week, and this was not the case. Um, well, if that's right, why, why were the minutes drafted in that way, but perhaps more importantly, because we know that mistakes can be made, why weren't the minutes corrected either in February shortly after the meeting or certainly before they were published in May? I don't know, and uh, unfortunately, it was probably our misstep not to have picked this up and corrected it sooner. Would you um, routinely, not you necessarily personally, but PHE, as an attender at a SAGE meeting, have been asked to approve the minutes in the way that perhaps is normal in other committee meetings? Uh, when I eventually attended SAGE, uh, the minutes were approved uh, at the next meeting of SAGE, yes. But generally they were written and agreed internally first and then presented to SAGE. And very often the agendas were very pressured and crowded and it simply may have been missed. This is obviously important in its own terms, Professor, but there is also a wider question about the accuracy, the comprehensibility of SAGE minutes, because this is not the first occasion where we have found that people didn't understand what SAGE was trying to say in its minutes. Um, do you think it could have been done better? There, there could have been a better process uh, for your organisation, but also other organisations, uh, agreeing on the accurate and clear content of SAGE minutes? It was certainly a cogent lesson for Public Health England that they really could have moved quicker to put this to rights and help, actually, Professor Valence, uh, you know, who was a very busy person and his secretariat. I don't think we picked this up fast enough. And it became into popular narrative, which became very difficult to deal with. I, I want to move um, on to another subject, Professor, and... When I asked you at the beginning of your evidence about the different uh, areas in which uh, Public Health England worked, you, you mentioned uh, disparities as being one of those um, issues that you uh, w were tasked to addressing. Uh, and of course, that, that is something that applied particularly at a time of emergency like the COVID pandemic. Yes. Um, and we've heard um, much evidence now about the very early indications of the disproportionate impact of COVID. Uh, probably, first of all, disproportionate act, um, impact on elderly people, but very shortly followed um, by evidence of disproportionate impact on the uh, black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities, um, particularly in, in, in the healthcare sector. Yes. Uh, and it's right, isn't it, that... Um, Public Health England was commissioned, I think by Chris Whitty, to conduct uh, research into those issues um, early in the pandemic. I think it probably was April or May of 2020. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and that resulted in, in a report, did it not? Um, thank you. It's been brought up on screen. Um, called Disparities in the Risk and Outcomes of COVID-19. Yes. Were you involved in any way in either researching or writing this report? I was involved uh, first in uh, identifying the signals. Uh, I didn't do the epidemiology, but I asked uh, my colleagues as SRO to, to find those signals. And then to, we stood up a team to get involved in producing this report for the CMO, yes. Um, it, it was published on the 2nd of June, 2020. Um, and if we look at the... Uh, third page of the report, please, um, we can see from its contents um, that it uh, had sections throughout the report on different vulnerable sectors um, within the population. Yes. Um, but it, we've also heard that almost as soon as the report was published, there was criticism of it. Um, and we can see, if we go to another document, please, uh, 97872. This is a letter, um, in fact, to Matt Hancock, um, dated the 12th of June, so 
a week or so, 10 days after the publication of that report. Um, and in summary, um, Professor, there was criticism that the report, which we've just looked at, first of all, didn't contain the input that had been received from uh, inequality and other groups, but more importantly, perhaps, didn't include any recommendations. Um, one might have thought that recommendations were at the heart of the purpose of a report like this. So, um, first of all, do you agree? And secondly, if so, why didn't that report contain any recommendations? I do agree, and the criticisms were understood. And uh, I was very, uh, very concerned and sensitive about that, as was my good colleague, uh, Professor Kevin Fenton. We did get those recommendations out into the public domain. It took some time. Uh, there were six or seven of them. Um, they were challenging to us, and the uh, the recommendations eventually went to the uh, Minister for Disparities and into the um, Cabinet Office for uh, sorry to the Office for Disparities uh, within government. And there were quarterly reports about how that uh, those recommendations or requests really were being dealt with. So there was some follow-on. But, but the short question, though, Professor, is why were those recommendations not published with the report containing the research <coughs> on which the recommendations were based? Well, initially, there were a number of issues um, that led to these delays. Um, the first was that it wasn't entirely accepted that the this kind of qualitative work had the same value as the quantitative work and uh, therefore you know it, it we needed to make sure that everybody understood this was a very balanced piece of work it was intended to show the epidemiology but also get the voices of people into this um, discussion and also what they were telling us that needed to happen which was going to be challenging uh, that I think needed, those recommendations, those requests did need some discussion internally in government as to who owned them. They were very much about cross-government, they weren't simply about the NHS. So it did take time, but it did emerge uh, into the public domain and there was a commitment which was followed on. So in that sense, the work had some impact. Um, Professor. I'm not going to take you to the recommendations themselves. I know you're familiar with them. They were contained in a subsequent report, were they not? Yes. But you know that the inquiry has heard evidence um, from Professor Kunti uh, criticising the recommendations, uh, saying that they, that they were too general, uh, they didn't contain a clear programme of action, um, they didn't contain any timeframes for delivery, or methods of implementation. In, in summary, uh, you've already, in part, defended the recommendations, but what do you say to those criticisms? I completely agree that if recommendations don't have um, named organisations or individuals, preferably, uh, they don't go anywhere. And these recommendations were taken through the Race Disparities Unit, which was appropriate, and the Cabinet Office were interested also because we gave talks across government on it. But I do agree with Professor Conti that it will take hard work to continue to implement some of this. Uh, for instance, uh, the, there's a lot of uh, recommendation around fair assessment at work, uh, work that is, um, you know, culturally well orientated towards people uh, from various communities and so on. And that takes quite a lot of system change. And therefore, one of my recommendations is that we need to keep this very much inside the findings of these uh, reviews and not lose sight of this, which can be so easy to do. If we can just go back, Professor, to um, that report. So it's 101218. and look at page three. 
Um, that, you'll recall, is the, the, the contents page, so we see the different chapters of the report. Mm -hmm. um, and as I indicated, um, a, a range, if you like, of vulnerable groups. Um, we don't see there um, a, a section on disabled people, Professor. Um, why were they not identified um, as a, a vulnerable group who ought to be included in this work? Well, people with disabilities uh, certainly have been identified as vulnerable groups throughout the pandemic. Uh, we were requested and did undertake a further review of people with learning disabilities and autism, and that was published in the autumn of 2020. Uh, and its main purpose was to raise awareness of the vulnerability, particularly of this group for in terms of mortality, which it did. Uh, and that was presented then to particularly to uh, the interested parties in the NHS uh, and clinicians and others uh, in uh, the care home sector who uh, would benefit from knowing this information. Learning disabilities and autism, but what about yeah. physically disabled people? Well, physical disabilities, uh, they're, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether they're actually included in uh, here, but they certainly have come across various groups. It may well have been that we should have concentrated on that particular group as well. Um, yes. Um, Professor, thank you very much. Uh, those were my questions for you. My lady, there are, uh, as you know, some questions from core participants. There are. I think, Ms Mitchell, you're going first. statement that Public Health England has a specific remit um, from the Secretary of State and that remit includes the UK's national focal point and that deals with international health regulations or you ensure that you comply with them. <coughs> Given this was a UK remit, what I would like to understand is what part Scotland, be it Public Health Scotland or what you've described um, in your evidence as the Standing Four Countries Infectious Disease Group. What input did Scotland have into that process? Uh, well, before 2020, there was, and there continued to be, a, a four-country group of uh, health protection directors, senior leaders, which my department supported, and the chair rotated. I think it was with Wales just before 2020, but it had been with Scotland. So we were equal partners in that. Um, we had the four-country infectious disease consultants and the four-country infection prevention control uh, experts who met regularly. We had the regular clinicians meetings, which were four countries during the pandemic. And I chaired uh, throughout 2021 a four-country genomics group. Uh, my purpose there was to ensure that the uh, devolved countries got their fair share of funding for the development of their genomic services. Um, as well as that, we had regular, every day, we had situation awareness with the four countries and when they wished to join the Republic of Ireland. And we kept very close contact on an ad hoc basis with our colleagues in Public Health Scotland. Milady, thank you. I don't have any more questions. My other questions were answered earlier. Thank you very much indeed. Mr Stanton. Professor, um, I'll be asking you a small number of questions on behalf of the British Medical Association. <coughs> um, I apologise for the slightly awkward positioning. Uh, please don't feel any need uh, to face me. Um, I'd like to um, uh, bring to your attention um, a letter of the BMA as context for the questions uh, I have. Um, the letter is uh, document 97875. And at the fourth paragraph, um, I'll just read, <coughs> uh, I beg your pardon, I should say, um, the letter is addressed to Michael Brodie, who at the time was interim chief executive. 
You may uh, not have seen this letter before, but um, it's possible you have, given your role. Um, fourth paragraph uh, reads, there are significant and growing concerns about the role of aerosol transmission of COVID-19 in healthcare settings and the need for wider use of RPE, for example, FFP3 respirators, outside of those procedures designated as aerosol generating. We are therefore calling on Public Health England to support the wider use of RPE in other high-risk settings across primary and secondary care. Um, Professor, so th the first um, question I um, have for you is, um, appreciating that the was considerable uncertainty um, in the early stages, of the early stages of the pandemic. When did Public Health England first become aware that aerosol transmission um, was a significant transmission route of COVID-19, including through daily actions such as coughing, talking, etc.? Thank you. So there was always a recognition, well, from fairly early on, that aerosol transmission could occur. I think what changed um, over the months, and particularly uh, after the summer of 2020, was the uh, work that had been done, particularly through SAGE and through its subgroup, and, uh, and Professor Noakes, of course, um, and the importance of uh, aerosol, uh, the balance of aerosol transmission versus droplet versus fomite and uh, you know, surface uh, transmission. And that balance changed. Um, uh, Professor Noakes is part of a number of uh, scientists who wrote to WHO and asked them to change their advice on this as well. But in the early months, we had certainly provided guidance for those who were in the context of what were known to be aerosol generating procedures, and certainly a precaution around the importance of uh, social di of distancing, and where at all feasible, um, the use of face coverings. Now, that uh, came again to a discussion later in 2020, um, and I am aware of this letter uh, in 2021, uh, which um, uh, uh, Mr. Brody received. He did ask for the, the guidance that had been produced around this letter was a four country guidance and it was also NHS and DHSC. So it was the Infection Prevention and Control Group who had produced the guidance on uh, what protective equipment was needed and aerosol procedures. And uh, the IPC cell, this Infection Prevention Control Cell, was asked to look at that guidance again at the end of 2020, which they did. They also did this in conjunction with the new and emerging virus group, Nerve Tag. And uh, they uh, had a good look also at the evidence because there was a lot of testing going on in uh, various healthcare settings. This was about healthcare. And the testing had shown that actually, this was in the context of the Alpha variant, that there hadn't been an increase in uh, serious illness among healthcare workers, but that healthcare worker to healthcare worker transmission was important. And therefore, a CAS alert had been issued, which I think Mr. Brody was able to advise the BMA, uh, which recommended the um, strengthening of infection control procedures. There was obviously um, an interest in ensuring that those who needed to use the highest level of equipment had access and did so, and guidance was produced on donning and doffing so that they could do so in the most effective way. But I can accept that this re remained an area of serious concern throughout the pandemic. Thank you, Professor. Um, Professor, um, could you help clarify um, how infection prevention control guidance is produced? Is it written, or was it written at the time by Public Health England? Well, it's uh, not entirely just by Public Health England. There is an, a National Infection Prevention Control Manual, and there is the four-country Infection Prevention Control Expert Group, and there are a number of subgroups, like NERVTAG, uh, which also advise on this. 
So um, it, the infection prevention control guidance takes account of the current evidence, which was very dynamic. It's gener it is put together by the infection control prevention. It is agreed by the infection control prevention group. Public Health England will write the guidance and will brand it with the NHS and with DHSC. But it's often called Public Health England guidance. But it is more than that. Thank you, Professor. Professor, um, did you, um, over the period of the pandemic, whilst contributing to infection prevention control guidance, detect any reluctance um, to impose measures that might otherwise have been required for reasons of resource or operational strain that they might place on the NHS? The whole pandemic was characterised by no easy decisions and the, balance, the need to balance the least bad option. And sometimes that related to supplies um, and sometimes it related to scientific opinion, which wasn't always in agreement, and sometimes it simply related to the right thing to do that some parties didn't agree with. But there was always tension in these decisions. There was no easy decision. So it is perfectly plausible that decisions had to be made that were certainly not optimal in normal times. And might decisions around the provision of FFP3 masks be one of those decisions, do you think? Well, I can't really comment on this in great detail just now, but we were very conscious of the need to ensure that FFP3 masks were used in the places where they were most needed by the people who were, the healthcare workers particularly, who were most exposed to dangerous situations. And that's what a lot of the guidance and the donning and doffing uh, was also put out there to support. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. Ms. Morris. Thank you, my questions are on Operation Nimbus. So at the risk of not knocking Mr. Men on off his perch, I've also reflected, and Mr. O'Connor has dealt with the matters that I was going to deal with with Professor Doyle, but we agree with the inquiry of the need to further inquiries be made of the Cabinet Office and the CCS in particular in that regard. So thank you. Very well. And whenever, whenever you and um, Mr. Betts or, uh, I can't remember who else was asking about Nimbus, but anyway, whenever we have the answers to the questions, in an agreed form, please let me know. And if they wish, if you wish them to be read out, then I'll be very happy to say. It, it may be for another witness, in fact, my lady. All right. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, Mr. Potter. No, lady. That that that's, um, concludes the questioning for this witness and also for today. Thank you very much indeed, Professor. Thank you, my lady. And that completes the evidence for today, as Mr. O'Connor says. So we return at ten thirty on Monday. All right. Maybe yes. Thank you all. Bye -bye.